Um, I was leaning heavy towards like um, the farming and the survival for Ju uh, July's classes. In August, I know some people that were coming to some of those classes really wanted the K&F and cannabis side of it. So I wanted to do this class to appease those people. And then, uh, and then I got some feedback that, you know, some people are scared of coming to the cannabis class. So it's just like kind of like, a, you know, um, just got to, <laughs> we're trying our best, you know. <laughs> but um, anyway, a couple announcements. Um, the guy at the very front building there last week, he kind of mentioned that he was worried about this and that uh, uh, government, this and that. So just if, if anybody comes to hassle us, just let you guys know this is a spiritual service. So we're allowed to have more than 10 gather and it's also an educational uh, establishment. So we're allowed to have more than 10 gather. Um, the only thing that we're not doing is social distancing and masking. So just if anyone comes, I'm going to go to the door and talk to them first. And you guys can just kind of hold some space and just make it look like that we're distancing. But if you're in the same household, you can still be together legally and all this stuff. So we're just going to appease them as much as possible without making a scene or making it weird. And then I'll talk to them if they come. But I have a great feeling that no one's going to come. So just better safe than sorry. Um, my mom was a little paranoid at the deli next door because of the guy was was kind of hounding her. So she printed out a uh, menu. So if you get a chance to before break to, if you're gonna order lunch, you could you could look at this menu and just put your name and order on this. Um, and uh, and I'll just basically leave that at the front there. And before lunch break, if you could fill those out and someone's going to come pick up these things. Um, I could even pass it around now, but I know no one's really thinking about lunch at the moment. So um, anyway, those are a couple of announcements I was going to make. Mike, can you throw that back on that table for me, bro? Appreciate that. And yeah, just if, if you know for sure you're going to get lunch, go ahead and uh, go fill out one of those just at your leisure anytime during the talk. And uh, Hopefully we'll get it get it uh, done properly. But anyway, we're here for uh, KNF Korean Natural Farming and how to utilize Korean Natural Farming uh, in cannabis. And um, it's a direct correlation, one to one. Uh, what's great about cannabis is that it shows you all those stages that Master Cho really, really pushes really hard is to understand the stage your plant is in and what I mean by that is if it's vegging in a cakey state, if it's crossing over and starting to flower or if it's actually in its flowering or finishing state and to have the intuition and the, the knowledge to be able to recognize those just by visual sight is a really big part of Korean natural farming. It's actually a huge part of it and the cannabis plant is brilliant for showing us those stages. It's pretty much like a like a perfect plant to show us the stages. It's vegging, it's vegging, and then some hairs mature. You know that's crossing over into flowering, and then a flower emerges. Uh, it starts getting tighter and tighter and bigger and bigger. You know it's ripening, um, and then you can see it, see the, the leaves and the crystals start to fade to darker colors, and uh, maybe some yellows and purples in the leaves when it starts to fade to finish. And you can know just by looking at the plant, what stage it's in, and that's critical in Korean natural farming. Um, before I get too far along, the donation uh, box is right here. Um, I didn't collect any money ahead of time, so uh, the su suggested donation for today's class is 30 bucks. And um, obviously, uh, if you don't have any money, I still welcome you here, but 30. Could you throw that over there too, Mike? Thanks, Phil. Um, is su today's suggested donation. Um, reason being, I printed up some packets that costed a little bit, but uh, besides that, it's just uh, so you have uh, the value to take home in your mind. So I'm going to pass these out. You could take one and pass it on. If you don't get a packet, first of all, don't take one if you already own this book or if you already know Korean natural farming, if you already know the recipes. Don't, you don't need a packet. Just take a packet if you have zero information about Korean natural farming to take home today. And um, if, if someone that really needs one doesn't get one, I'll print them up and make sure to get it to them. I only made 15 altogether because of time restraints. And then I have one of these also for sale, which is Drake uh, Natural Farming Hawaii.com or .net. Drake Weinert, who's a really good friend of mine and one of the leading uh, 
KNF experts on the island makes this booklet and I have one of these left too. But anyway, I just want to make sure everyone has that packet today and we're going to be going over it um, as, the, as this class progresses. Um, a couple terms that I always go over to start a natural farming class or a uh, Korean natural farming class and some hashtags you could look at on your Instagram or something to gain some insight and information. Obviously natural farming, KNF, this word esoteric farming. Anyone know what esoteric means? Any students that have heard me go over this already know. Esoteric, the hidden information only revealed to a chosen few. You know, yeah, so, so that's what we're doing today. We're indulging in some esoteric information, uh, the opposite of exoteric, which is just common knowledge, like, like a mainstream information. This is esoteric information. It's the underground, you know, for some reason, but we're bringing it exo. That's how we're bringing it. Microbial shepherds. Um, this is a concept that just means that we're becoming a, a microbial, uh, we're parenting, we're like shepherding these microbes just like someone with a flock of uh, sheep or cow or whatever and they'd move them from pasture to pasture to get done what they want to get done. Well, we're doing the same thing with microbes. We're shepherding them around our farm, moving them to sections uh, that we need to bioremediate and we need to be fertile and we're going to go ahead and actually uh, shepherd those. And another word that I like to use here is uh, microbial husbandry. Because just like you're, you're, you raise um, uh, animals and it's called animal husbandry and you take care of them every day and if you don't, they're not going to make it. Just like your children, if you're not, if you're not uh, providing and protecting like a husband would do, then they're not going to get that, you know. So same thing, we're going to do a husbandry of the microbes, provide and protect for them and uh, make sure that they're well established and and uh, doing their thing. Institute of Natural Farming is the new uh, handle for this school. You should give that a follow if you don't. Um, the last one that I always want to mention is the human bio instrument. And but what I mean by that is to tap into yourself instead of depending on uh, measuring cups and uh, thermometers and probes. What we're doing with natural farming is learning to, to rely on our nose, on our mouth, on our fingertips, on our ears, and to plug back into uh, reality and, um, and to uh, start living that, that natural farming life. Usually uh, uh, I go deep, if I was doing a KNF class, I, I would go into the mind of a natural farmer, but we just did this presentation not so many weeks ago. It was a whole class just on the mind of a natural farmer, so I'm just gonna go over it really fast. Uh, mind of a natural farmer. Um, just think of the old world farmer without a grocery store, without a, uh, without a grow store, a farming garden. What did he use? Because he was growing crops successfully and he was feeding multitudes, millions and thousands. What did he use? He didn't go to the store, he didn't have chemical fertilizers, but yet he did it successfully for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years without a store, without a label, without a brand, without a, a scientist behind the door without anybody saying this is good or this is bad. He still did it, right? The old world farmer. He crushed it. He crushed it harder than we're crushing it now. Way harder. Ancient technology, microbial possibilities. We talked about that the other day of, um, you know, where's our ancestors? Our ancestors are the soil. Our ancestors are the uh, microbes of old. You know, they carry, microbes are, are, uh, carry DNA. Viruses transfer DNA. You know, these, these things are critical. Um, our, our ancestors' DNA is in the soil. Their actual bones were decomposed and eaten by microbes and their DNA transferred into those microbes and those microbes became pieces of your ancestors. And that's, um, that's what we're dealing with, with ancient technologies. Basically, once you start d diving into these things, you're going to start having these uh, intuition is going to go start skyrocketing and, and what I mean by ancient technologies and microbial possibilities you'll come up with some of these on your own you're going to start seeing like wow and then oh if I ferment that like this oh what if I left it four more days what if I added this ingredient and you'll start seeing that there's so many uh, things to unlock ancient mysteries that uh, that were once common knowledge that now we can unlock as practitioners of natural farming um, 
I always go through uh, through this this, uh, and if you've heard all this before, just bear with me. Um, akua, who? What is akua in Hawaiian? That's the word for God or Creator, and um, we're talking about the unseen worlds of the microbes, right? Um, if you if you were to look up fungi or fungus or mushroom or m uh, mycorrhizae, um, and you look for the Hawaiian word for that. It's pretty amazing you'd come across the same word, you know, and we went over this in class during the Mind of a Natural Farmer about uh, uh, Vishnu and, uh, and uh, Brahma and the, the sustainer and the creator and the destroyer, creator, sustainer, destroyer, just like the mushroom, creator, sustainer, destroyer, Akua, creator, sustainer, de the unseen world. We can only see so much with our, with our bio instruments, right? Our vision only sees a certain spectrum, gets lost on the, once we start going ultraviolet and infrared. But those worlds still exist, even though we don't perceive them. So let's keep that in mind. The sound, we only hear a certain decibel of sound. You can do a dog whistle, you can't hear it, but they can. So it just we got to be aware that these worlds exist outside of our perception of them. And, that, and we need to tap into those worlds, even though we don't necessarily feel or see them right away. But through fermentation, through making these things, and the unseen world becomes seen. Um, visible spectrum, same thing. Um, food as an essential resource. Uh, mind must understand nature's plan. We're here for nature's plan, not your plan. So a lot of time man plans, but nature destroys, you know? So we need to, to have that in mind, that, it, that no matter what your plan is, if it's not in accordance with the nature around you, it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a struggle. I'm not saying you can't do it. You can, you can grow cucumbers in Coloco if you really want to try that hard to do it and be out there every single day spraying them with neem, setting up a little greenhouse over them, like literally every day with neem if you want to pull off a cucumber in Halualoa or South Kona or Coloco or something, you know? So, so just keep, we're going to keep understand nature's plan over man's plan. And the main thing is the main takeaway, uh, or one of the main takeaways of KNF is teaming with nature. We're, we're going with nature as our, our employees, nature as our partnership, nature as our relationship, as opposed to going to the store and teaming with tech companies and corporations that think they know better than you by putting something in a bottle and telling you it's a proprietary blend and you can't have the recipe. But go ahead and use it and come back and buy more when you run out. You know, that's, that's the model of industrial farming and also organic farming. It's the same model. Organic farming, all they did was replace the, the chemical crystals with, uh, with um, you know, micronized uh, uh, plant products, you know, alfalfa meal, crab shell meal, just byproducts of other industries and they ground them down, stuck them in bags and sold it to farmers and said it was the organic farming industry. Same exact uh, thing, it's NPK related, and, uh, and you, you put down the NPK on the field and the plant's supposed to respond. That's only half the story. They didn't tell you the other half of the story, that the microbes need to eat that, that dry amendment, break it down, and not till they break it down will your plant even be able to absorb it. So, um, Again, I didn't want to get stuck too much on this course because we already taught this course a couple weeks ago, but uh, history of ag, we'll go through it real quick. I want you guys to think about the uh, aboriginals, the Native Americans, the Easter Island natives, uh, the ancient European uh, people, the Hawaiians. How did they feed themselves? How did they eat? What were their systems? The ahu, Ahupua'a system of the Hawaiians. The uh, the Native Americans and Australian uh, ancient Aborigines used to basically um, they would uh, they would caretake nature and kind of help expand it. They wouldn't necessarily do intensive agriculture, but they would do gathering and planting strategically um, just to help nature along or help the, the like the the, the Native uh, Aboriginals had these tubers they would eat and uh, they would grow naturally. But they would help by plucking the babies and actually planting the rows bigger and longer so the patch would expand through human intervention faster and more healthy than if, uh, if it were just left wild. So we have, and, and the, the colonizer will tell you these people had no agriculture. That's the common even to today. 
you have to argue with the, with the, with the colonized mind to tell them that these ancients had agricultural systems. You'd have to argue to pr prove that point, even though there's books about it and there's all these accounts about it and everything, you know? So anyway, um, moving through, and then you can, you can pay attention to ancient technologies like the Three Sisters, you know, planting pumpkin, corn, and beans together for all the symbiotic relationships that are caused, you know? And so we, we can learn from these people. Um, just real quick, basically World War II is what brought an end to 80% of the population of all Americans being farmers. World War II brought an end to that with chemical agriculture and they, they implemented it around the world and if you didn't use their blue crystals on your farm you were punished. Jail time, murder, kidnap your children, kill off your livestock, ransack your gardens if you didn't cooperate with, with chemical ag, big ag, which was actually the leftovers of the, uh, of the munitions and bomb industries that they used to, to, to complete World War I and II. The factories that make chemical fertilizer can within months be turned into a factory that makes weapons. They're one for one. So, so as soon as the weapon munition thing was out of business, they just started keeping the same thing going to manufacture chemicals to farm with. So we got to understand the, the mind of the deceiver, you know? Chemical ag leads to desertification uh, and flash forward to 2020, less than 2%, from 80 to 2% of the population farms or has something to do with the food industry. When food became a commodity, we lost diversity. That's the main point that I want to make too. Food as a commodity, when what I mean by that is if it's shippable, pickable, storable, uh, can sit on a store shelf for a long time without rotting. So instead of uh, 50 varieties of corn, we get two, you know. Instead of 80 varieties of potato, you get two, you know. And, and, and instead of 100 varieties of tomatoes, you get two. And, the, and what that does is it, it also m takes away the, the ability to diversify your gut biome too because you're only putting limited ingredients in your, in your belly and limited uh, varieties that are, that are only feeding certain microbial populations. And that leads to a loss of diversity and leads to loss of health in the human being. Food, food as a global control mechanism is basically what the elites have done with food. Instead of it being a, a, a product for everyone, it's become a control mechanism. No one should be hungry. Any, any indigenous or native system, no one was hungry. There's, not, there's way more than enough food to feed everyone in the world. It's just the politics that, that make it not so. You know, so don't let them fool you with the scarcity of food thing. But who will save us? And I'm not going to get into everyone that will save us today, but I am going to get into this guy right here. Who's going to save us? It's, it's us that is going to save us, and it's these teachers that are going to save us. This right here is Master Cho. Master Cho is responsible for writing the KNF Basics book and also the book of recipes. Um, Master Cho basically he went around the world, or not around the world, when he was a student um, learning all this stuff, he learned from three masters. One of them was an, an enzyme specialist, one was a fermentation and microbial specialist, and one was an uh, ancient farming specialist. Uh, and he kind of married the, those, those three masters together to, to come up with Korean natural farming. Master Cho to me is also a sleeping prophet. No one else will tell you this, but to me he's a sleeping prophet. Do you guys know what that means? A sleeping prophet. I don't know. Have you guys heard of us people like Edgar Cayce before? Edgar Cayce or even Steiner would claim, but even like some of these new age people will claim it too. But anyway, a sleeping prophet is someone who gets illuminations or messages sent to him without trying to get them. And a lot of times happens when they're sleeping or about to fall asleep or when they're about to wake up, kind of like when you have lucid dreams and stuff like that. So those dreams would be messages. 
And for Master Cho, and the reason I'm saying this is because during some of his lectures that I went to, he, he said, so I woke up in the middle of the night and I wrote down the recipe that came to me. So he didn't claim any of this. This is my interpretation. So he, he, he told me about first-hand stories or actually lectured about him waking in the middle of the night or, or having an, a sudden urge to write down a recipe. And of course, this is obviously intelligence will bring this about too because it happens to all of us. Uh, the more intelligent we are, the more we read that night, maybe something might click right before you go to bed and you go, oh man, that, that's a thought I never had before. And it's just like some revelation, you know. So I'm not saying like it's completely out of the ordinary, but, that, but I feel that he was, you know, given to the human society because no one else brought forward this information. He did. Pretty, pretty deep that someone would come up with these nine or twelve core solutions that you have complete independence from, uh, from any other person to grow your crops, you know, from any other industry, from any product. That's amazing. That's like liberation, right? So a lot of what Master Cho talks about is, uh, is liberating the farmer, making the farm, farming not a burden, but something that's, that's enjoyable, that brings you satisfaction and gratif gratification, right? Because if you're solely dependent on the 16, 16, 16, you're tripping out when you start running out and you got to run to the store and it becomes an anxiety trip, it becomes a hassle, it becomes uh, something that's not fun anymore, it becomes a job. So we're making farming fun again. That's what we're doing, KNF style. So um, let me just share a little bit from Master Cho, uh, verbatim from his mouth, and then we're going to get into this why KNF a little bit of KNF philosophy and then we're going to go over these solutions. And then I'm going to break down how to use the solutions in your cannabis garden and how to set up a cannabis garden start to finish in a, can or in a natural farming method. So, um, and then we'll go to lunch. And after lunch we're going to make an FPJ and we're going to make a uh, WCA, water soluble calcium. So. We'll do a couple demos after lunch if anyone that wants to stay for that. So from Master Cho's book here, I'm just going to read you uh, from, from chapter one, Principles of Natural Farming. Number one, follow the path of nature. What does agriculture really mean for farmers? Agriculture means holy labor. Used to make nutrients that are the source of sustaining life and health of humans as they live within nature and regard the nature as a fundamental playground. Additionally, agriculture is a way of life in which the wisdom and labor force of humans are harmonized with the natural conditions such as sun rays, air, soil, water, animals, and they produce something to eat. Wow, sounds amazing to me. To do so, we should prepare for the always changing environments with the view of the nature and the truth accumulated by our ancestors and wise men and women of the past. Additionally, we should make firm the foundation of life so that we may not be ashamed even passed along to the descendants the legacy of fully utilizing the environment of our hometown without destroying the natural environment while honoring the basics rights to live not only for ourselves but also for animals and plants, right? Seven generations we got to be thinking. We got to use our mind a little bit more than we are right now as a human collective. And we got to think about the keiki and their keiki and theirs and theirs. Seven generations. That's what the Native Americans taught us. Seven generations is what we are responsible for. And if you read in the Bible, in the beginning it says, the sins of thy father will be for the generations to follow. So maybe your sin might not be for you, but it's for the generations that follow. And right now we are collectively feeling the collective sin of all the farmers before us on this island that sprayed Roundup and, uh, and, and scraped away topsoil and uh, 
and sprayed chemical agriculture or, or chemical products that all leached in and went right down into our ocean. I don't know if you guys have gone snorkeling lately or diving. Man, I lived here when I was when I was really young, and I would go out in those oceans, and there was. 5,000 times more life than I see in there. This is just from my lifetime, just in a 20, 30 year period. This out here is dead. Do you know why this is the Gold Coast? Does anyone know why this is the Gold Coast? Yeah. Tell them why. The yellow tangs. When you flew into the island, there was so much yellow tang along the coast, this was the Gold Coast. From the sky, the coast was yellow. Go out there right now. Yellow tangs are, are far and few between. They kind of hang out in small packs. Imagine a whole coast filled with life. So why would we live in, why would we want that life? Why would we want to leave that for our children? It makes zero sense to me. If you can make any sense of that, please let me know how it makes sense because I can't make any sense of that at all. Why we would want no yellow tang and just 50 years ago, the whole coast was filled with them. Why we would want degraded soil and not, not soil holding life. Why we would want runoff. You see these, these uh, streams come down and they got all these things, all these, uh, the streams come down the, the mountain like this and we got to wait in traffic when it's raining. Those used to be streams and rivers. But for some reason, we thought a road would be better than honoring that stream and that waterway. And now we have to deal with the repercussions of putting tunnels under the road. So, so, and, but we don't see it. We're just living life. We're just driving. But little did we know that used to be a river. Now it just looks like a flood when it rains. And it's a, it's a burden. But that used to be the carrier of life. The reason why the ocean was clean. Dumping microbes from the mountains into the ocean to help. So we got to tap back in. That's my main point. Humans cannot make anything relying on their own powers to sustain their life. I'll read that again. Humans cannot make anything relying on their own powers to sustain their life. Even humans who regard themselves as the most precious living creature were not born into this world by their own will. Likewise, the death also is not decided by human will. Even though humans claim that they are the lords of all creation, the reality is that they cannot control and manage themselves as much as they would like to think they do. Do you think that you can digest the food you eat by yourself? You think you digest food? Think again. Intestines only move by automatic nerves, but they are not dependent on human's own will. If the intestines are dependent on reckless desire of human, the desire cannot be satisfied. And even a lot of whole seawater is gulped. So he's just saying that the, the, if it was up to you, you would, you would just never stop consuming, you know? However, nature knows desire's limits and assigns the order of restraints to the intestines to keep their own health. This is the rhythm of nature. And, and uh, to, to bring the point home, then microbes digest your food. Remember that. The celestial mo mo movements of nature does not depend on knowledge of humans. The nature's rhythm and ways it is to make the foundation of life under truthful and harmonious oneness with others while the entire living organism obediently plays their own role, respecting and admitting the presence of other, uh, others. The true agriculture is to cultivate the field and raise livestock following this kind of nature's rhythm. Agriculture and animal science full of commercialism and industrialism soaked with hazardous materials made by chemical industries and physics that's based on shallow knowledge of humans do not go well to the farmer's state of mind that want to live together while admitting the existence of other living forms and respecting their lives. So that's this chapter one out of this book. And you can kind of get, get to see the uh, mindset of Master Cho, right? So Master Cho... It's pretty deep because Cho is the building blocks of life. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. The building blocks of life are, are in the guy's name. You know, just to add a, a layer of mysticism to it, you know? <laughs> Any questions so far? Okay, we're going to keep rolling. Philosophy, or why, so why KNF? 
Uh, you guys might already know these answers. I'm just going to go over a few reasons why KNF. Maximize soil microbiology to increase nutrient uptake, therefore increasing yield, potency, terpene profile, and overall health of the plant. Converted to the human ingesting it, you get to, to uh, increase your health and your microbiology and all those inc uh, increased nutrient uptake. You get to, get to uh, indulge in those gifts. Uh, high grade. The, the increase in health lets you uh, cut back on pest management. So you're going to be cutting way back on, uh, on uh, IPM, Integrated Pest Management. You'll hear that today too if you want to make note of IPM is, is a agricultural term, Integrated Pest Management. We'll talk about that a lot today. But we're going to cut back on how much, you get, how much labor goes into that and how much products go into that by utilizing KNF and mainly by increasing fertility. We're going to cut costs. We're going to do it ourselves. So something like a bottle of FAA, you know, this one filled to the brim is probably a, a $30, $40 product for a nitrogen uh, grow formula from, from a, a hydro store, you know. So we just made that for just the cost of brown sugar. And we're going to talk more about that today. So the best benefit I feel with natural farming is that you become part of nature. Instead of you being the dictator of nature or the lord of the land, you, you get to become integrated with nature and be humbled in the presence of the worms and the microbes and the dragonflies and the birds and the bees and the spiders. And therefore, when you see the spider, you won't smash it. You'll know that it has a spot and a place in that food web, right? We've gone over the soil food web so many times already. I'm not going to do it again today. But the soil food web is how plants eat. Microbes break down nutrients. They excrete the nutrients that then the plant roots uptake. Plants don't eat fertilizer. Microbes do. Chemical fertilizer, on the other hand, is direct injection into the plant root, bypassing the microbe. And that's what Babylon wants. That's what the, the, uh, the rulers of the world want. They want no microbes. That's why you eat packaged food that doesn't do anything good for your microbes. That's, the packaged food is kind of like the crack to the vein, like the, uh, like the, um, like the chemical food for the plants. All right, so philosophy of Master Cho, we talked about the three masters, the ancient farmer, the fermentation, and the enzyme masters that he learned from. Um, Master Cho also talks a lot about Genesis, the book of Genesis, because in the beginning there was the water, the sea, in the beginning. And then the land rose out of the ocean. Like you can imagine the islands right now. we got a brand new island coming up, right? Maybe in, what, what 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100,000 years it'll be an island, right? The water, or the land busted from the ocean. So what he always talks about is we need to remind the mountain of its mother. So that's the seawater. And he's a big proponent of using seawater. Um, this is also a, a, a sea salt um, replacement for seawater if you live inland. But uh, ocean water is always a great thing to incorporate into your agricultural system. Pretty much every ag system is low on, uh, micro, on um, trace elements and we're going to go over that today, that uh, the ocean has pretty much every trace element, macro and minor, known to man. So uh, Cho is, is a big, big talking about, uh, about relating scripture to natural farming, and the first way he does that is uh, talking about the ocean emerging from the sea in the book of Genesis. Um, he also talks about the plant-human microbe relationship. And we've gone over this in class a few times. I'll do it one more time. Basically, all living organisms created by our Creator in this realm that we live in called Earth or whatever you, you want to call it, they all do the same function. At least 99% of them do. All living beings. And what I mean by that is they all eat, sleep, reproduce, 
Go to the bathroom. What else? I think that's that. Something like that. Yeah, it's like the main things that, that we do, right? Eat, sleep, go to the bathroom, reproduce. Breathe. Breathe. They all breathe. So, so whether we're talking about a plant, a cow, a human being, or a microbe, they all do the same thing. So little do you know, your plant is urinating at certain times, or it's excreting excrement, called exudates, all the time. So we got to understand that, that that process is the same across all beings, right? Sleep, eat, breathe, go to the bathroom, reproduce. Okay? So we need to keep that in mind. It's pretty important. Um, soil food web. Um, we talked about that earlier in class, the animal husbandry. Well, we're actually doing microbial husbandry. We, we touched on that already. That's one of the philosophies of Master Cho. And he, he does talk a lot. A lot of his teachings are about bioremediation. So remediating areas of the earth that have been detriment, like killed by chemical agriculture. Well, he has a, a bioremediation... Um, I don't think I put this in your packet, but this is a this symbolizes the bioremediation. And if you look at this chart right here, I'll, sh I'll break down this chart real quick. And it's basically saying, like, if you started right here at week zero, you have compacted soil. It's just purely compact in this column. Well, after doing the uh, the compost teas and the KNF nutrients, after week one, you're starting to fluff up and fertilize and keep get the soil fertile. Week two, you got double, and this is just by doing uh, these, these KNF sprays every, uh, every week or so. And he's just saying by, over here, by year, year one, you've, you've gotten uh, probably about six feet deep of, of now fertile soil. By year three, you pretty much have restored fertility to that piece of land. And now you can pretty much not even have to put any more nutrients on it. It'll start keeping itself fertile because now you're in the cycle of nature again. So he's just saying if you practice these things and, and you're on your property doing them on a consistent basis, what we're doing is bioremediating land that used to be non-plantable or dead due to human or, or chemical agriculture into a, to a highly advanced fertile system. You know? So... Any questions on that? Philosophy? You guys good? Okay, we're just gonna we're just gonna keep that as the uh, as the philosophy, and then we're gonna go over the inputs now. If you guys are ready to do that. Yes, I'll talk real quick about Masanobu Fukuoka also because we're going to be incorporating some of his teachings into it when, we, when I show you the bed setup and the, uh, the cannabis uh, living soil and, and um, proper setup for your cannabis. We're going to be incorporating some of his teachings too. The same, same, on the same line as Master Cho in that we want to be in line and we want to work with nature instead of uh, our own thoughts or some chemical corporation or something. And so Masanobu Fukuoka, if you haven't read One Straw Revolution, it's a, a book about farming philosophy and also he breaks down a lot of information about his farm in Japan. You, it's a must read. It's a life changing read. Uh, One Straw Revolution. As far as being in the mindset of a natural farmer, they also have it on audiobook. So you can just listen to it while you're driving and uh, read, that, read that book and, and, and feel what this man has to say. He also, some people coined his farming as Buddhist farming. But it's just really just tuning back into nature, you know. He says, he calls it do-nothing farming. It's not really quite that easy, but it's, it's really, a, to rephrase that, do-nothing nature wouldn't do farming. So you are going to have to create nature-like environments that do take labor, but it's like do-nothing-dumb farming is really what he's saying. 
<laughs> okay. So, leave you with this quote. As far as Monsanobu, the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. So we're, we're not here today necessarily just to learn how to grow food. We're here today perfecting ourselves. To, be, uh, to tap back into our potential. Our genetic potential. Our human potential. Our God-like potential. Right? That's what we're here for cultivation and perfection of the human beings because once that happens everything else fades away chemical farming because we won't allow that in our consciousness anymore we won't allow profit over health that's gonna that's the state of mind of the natural farmer and and the world as soon as we all click back in to our potential I will just touch on this guy too before we jump in um, because we will be talking a little bit about his techniques too when we're building up our systems. Permaculture. You guys have heard that term before? Permaculture or permaculture design. Well the guy who came up with that is Bill Mollison who was like a wealthy dude that dropped out of society because he knew that it was false and wrong and he started tuning back into nature. And the reason why I put him up here today, not only is, are we going to incorporate some of his teachings into setting up our, our cannabis patches, but I wanted to read this. The greatest change we need to make is from consumption to production. Even if on a small scale in your own garden. So by buying these nutrients from the store, you're a consumer. By making these nutrients yourself, you're now a producer even on a small scale in our own gardens it makes a big difference this is coming this guy's super smart right he's not dumb if only 10% of us do this 10% there is enough for everyone so only 10% of us need to be smart and everyone else gets to eat high grade food uh, hence the futility of revolutionaries who have no gardens who depend on the very system they attack and who produce words and bullets, not food and shelter. Is that deep or what? For today? For right now? For what's going on in the world? Let's read that again. Hence the futility of revolutionaries who have no gardens, who depend on the very system they attack. Right? Come on. They're, they're attacking it and then they want their welfare check. No, no bueno. You can't have... You can't have both, man. Cake and eat it too. And who produce words and bullets, but not food and shelter. So who's the real revolutionary? You know? Who, who's protesting and what for? When, when really you should be doing this as the ultimate protest is feeding yourself, feeding your family, feeding your community. The ultimate protest is your life. The way you walk, talk, think, and affect others. That's your protest. I guarantee you half the people with the signs don't know what the fuck they're doing out there for one thing. And number two, they ain't living a clean life. They ain't living the real revolutionary life that makes a difference day to day to day. So it's not about how much no noise you make in the short term. It's about how much good you do in the long term. That's what it's about. Yeah, man. And this is Bill, Bill Mollison. Again, ain't no dummy. Okay, so let's get into natural farming. Um, um, could I get one of those packets if, from someone that might know a little bit about already? Okay, cool. So right here, uh, nine core natural farming solutions, right? Let me turn this back to uh, get on the same page. So yeah, there's nine core solutions in natural farming uh, that we've translated in the West to be the most necessary uh, to make a complete system. Now there are more. If you read Master Cho's books or you look at his charts that I've handed out in past KNF classes, there are more than nine, but we're going to focus on the nine because they're the most critical. Okay. So, oh, I got two of these. Is somebody 
want one of these back? It's just the extra. Oh, these are extra? Does anyone not get one of these that want one? Okay. Um, these, I, break, I basically break these into three categories, the nine core nutrients. And number one, we have ferments. So that's something that's living, it's microbial, um, it takes a fermentation process to make. Those are your FPJs, that's number three on here, fermented plant juice. Master Cho calls FPJ, the direct translation from the Korean is green juice from heaven. So that's a direct translation of FPJ, but in America we call it fermented plant juice. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, man, we should use that real terminology, bro. Come on, green juice from heaven. So, um, FPJ. I'll just get some of these going around the room, just so you guys know. Well, that's not a good one. That one's decent. That's a good one. Okay, um, I'm just going to pass a few of these around. You want to go ahead and start? You can pass those around. You're going to pass this one that way. So this one's some banana flour. And I don't know if he, these are gifted to me by someone who moved. I don't know if he's super saturated it or not. What you'll notice when you smell this one is it's going slightly alcohol. Did you smell that? The slightly alcohol tells you that it's getting no good. You smell this one, you'll smell a tiny bit of alcohol, but mostly this one's made out of cannabis. And you can smell the, the cannabis in there. That one's a banana flower. And I didn't make that one, but I made that one. And uh, just, you know, you guys can start kind of getting, getting the feel of this, you know, start tuning your nose in. Smell that one. That's a banana flower I made that's a little less alcoholic, and um, you can really smell the banana flower a lot more. What would you do with a product like this once it goes to that alcohol? Once it goes to alcohol, you could just uh, throw it on your compost pile, dilute it, and throw it on your compost pile. It's still beneficial, but since you're kind of losing the alchemy that you're targeting for your crop, like cannabis per se, I would, I would, I would refrain from using it. But if, if I was just doing like an overall farm spray, I would still use it. Yeah. But then if you're like just like uh, like man this is too alcoholic and then just throw it in the compost pile or dilute it into water and then put it in the compost pile because it's going to activate that compost pile still. Okay. There's still all kinds of benefits. So those two are both the same product, two different farmers made them and you can kind of smell the difference. FPJ, fermented plant juice from heaven is a uh, is a sugar ferment. We're going to we're going to go over that. Do I have any pictures of it? No, I don't. We're going to go over that uh, after the break and make a couple. But those are the finished products there. And you guys could smell them. Check them out. You can taste them if you want. They're all edible. All of these are edible. Everything we're going to go over is edible and beneficial to human beings, to the human gut biome. And uh, you can add them to your water, like your drinking water bottle you carry around with you. You just squirt them in there, same ratio as you would for your plants and you just carry them around in your drinking water for the day, strengthening your immune system, boosting your gut biome. Really good stuff. Um, more ferments, I'm just gonna, gonna go with these to show you these, uh, and I'll jump around on this list. The other ferments would be the BRV, is brown rice vinegar, ACV, apple cider vinegar, or on your own, really easy to make, is fruit vinegar, as in banana fruit vinegar and I'll show you some of the process of making that. So that's what this picture is here. This is a, uh, a five gallon bucket of uh, mango vinegar and um, it's really cool because when we go over these recipes, I guess I should break down the recipe for each one as we go because yeah. So as we go over these recipes they all kind of coincide with each other and what I mean by that is your your FPJ, fermented plant juice. Your FPJ is going to be plants plus 
brown sugar. And the recipe is on that, that it's in here on a, I think it's three or four pages back. So you got the recipe for FPJ. Plant pressed brown sugar. Um, you're gonna chop, and we're gonna do this after class. Mix, and one third full in a jar. So we're going to rewind a little bit and actually go over each one of these. So if you want to turn to the, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's the sixth page. It looks like this. Fermented plant juice. And we're just going to walk through this recipe and we're going to do a demo. This is the easiest KNF recipe. Everyone can go home and make one of these today or tomorrow morning. Okay, and I'm just going to break it down and we're going to walk through it real quick. The recipe, step number one, gather new growth tips early in the morning if you can. That's ideal because the tips of the plants have all the hormones, the growth enzymes, um, all the vigor and the strength and the vibration that we're looking for. So in particularly, um, the... Mikey, you think you can grab that the bin that looks like this? It's right out the door to the right. Um, in particular, if you're collecting grasses or, or squash tips or cho-cho tips or you want to do that in the morning. And so here's a... Thanks, Bridget. This is a, an example of stuff we're going to make today. And I picked all these. are all tips of uh, honu honu grass and desmodium, known as hitchhiker. And uh, you'll notice I left some of the soil on the roots. I got all these tips. They're all, ba they're all baby plants that were just growing from a recent weed whipping. And so, um, yeah, so that's what he's saying, to grab those in the morning. Um, and, for, and for now, as, as beginning students in KNF, we're just going to use one ingredient instead of combining ingredients. In advanced KNF, there's a few recipes where you combine ingredients. And that's it for a specific reason. And we're not going to go over that today, but we will in an advanced class. But you can combine FPJs in your solution after. So if you want to get the high potassium of the bananas, you can do so. Um, these were some bananas that were falling off the tree this morning. And uh, so if I wanted to capture some potassium from my FPJ from a banana, I could go ahead but my plants were still in a vegetative state, I could mix the honu honu grass FPJ with my banana to get the benefits of the uh, potassium in there too. Um, you're going to want to pick, the plant that you pick is for stages. So you have veg, right? Crossover. And flower. So when we pick our, uh, our plants, we're going to use quick growing tips and vegetative growing grasses, high nitrogen sources for our, uh, our veg phases. We're going to go ahead and look for banana flower or what I got here are um, ginger flowers that are just starting to come on. You know, so that, so what, what this plant is signaling to itself, right, this plant's telling itself I'm flowering now. The stage of this plant is in flowering. So, so we're going to start signaling to our microbes that, that, that we want it to flower. So we'll start giving it some, some unripe fruit or some premature flowering plants, right, for a crossover. When the, when the plant's in flower, there's a, there's a FPJ called FFJ, fermented fruit juice. And what that one is, is you're going to use like whole banana, uh, ripe and unripe banana, ripe and unripe mango, um, uh, you know, ripe squash, anything ripe and done, you know, because you're signaling to your flower that you want it to ripen and finish also. 
So the FPJ you make contains signals, hormones, enzymes, nutrients for the specific phase of your plant. Any questions about that? Just understand that? Okay, so we're going to pick our plants in the morning, we're going to chop them up, and we're going to uh, want them small enough to fit them in whatever vessel. Usually if you're making small amounts, these half gallon jars work well. Um, and you're going to mix it with brown sugar, and you're going to kind of massage it together till you see it start to juice up a little bit. And then you're going to put it one third full into an a empty mason jar. So that's important when fermenting. These ratios are real important. And what's interesting is they're all kind of like sacred number ratios. So it all starts making more sense even that like why two thirds full, one third empty is our best ratio for fermentation. A lot of times if you're too full, you're not going to get the right reaction. If you're too empty, you might get a, a premature uh, fungal growth on there. So we want it at the one third ratio. And if we know that it's something that's going to break down in the next couple days, we could go a little higher to three quarters and then it'll fall down to one third. Um, what we're going to look for, we're going to ferment our plants. We're going to stuff it hard down in there and pack it so it's nice and packed in there, just like you're making sauerkraut or something. And you got it packed in there to one third. You're going to let it ferment three to seven days. Seven for colder climates, three in the tropics. Depending on the material, also three to seven days. But generally speaking, in the tropics, you would definitely want to check it at day three and see where you're at. And what you're going to do, is this is going to have a breathable lid. So that could be as much as just putting this on loose so bugs don't crawl in. Or it can be to the point where it looks like this. They have the, uh, the, the paper towel or even, just so you guys know, computer paper, newspaper, brown paper bags are breathable. Keep that in mind when you see people with cloth on their face. Tape this right here, solid, right? Like I can't, I can't blow through this, but it's breathable. And the microbes that you need can pass right through these holes. They're about 40 times larger than a virus. So just keep that in mind uh, when you're out in the world. Um, yeah, fermented plant juice. Oh, then you're going to strain it. So, oh, so what you're looking for are two main things. You're looking for, you can also set a rock on top if you notice that your stuff starts floating. Stick a rock to keep it down, just like sauerkraut. You're going to come out here, day three, you're going to take the lid off and you're going to observe and you're going to smell. You're going to observe for a fluffy white mold and you're going to smell for the very first faint smell of alcohol. Those, both of those things and those things together are your signs that it's done. If it just has a white fuzz on top and there's no sign, it's only been three days, and no smell of alcohol at all, I mean it's usable, but go ahead and just push that, that fungus, that white fluff down back into the liquid and let it go another day and come back to right, right when you catch it on that verge of alcohol. If it's smelling too alcoholic, it went too long, and again, that can just go back in your compost pile and you can start again. But um, that first sign, now we're going to strain it. And after we strain it, we either have to refrigerate it with a sealed lid or even a breathable lid at that point. Yeah, you could either do either or. But in the refrigerator, is going to slow down everything because it's going to be cold, so all the microbes are going to stop moving and activating, and they're just going to be sitting there. Or if you don't have refrigerator space or you live off grid, you super saturate. Super saturation is critical in, in natural farming, especially uh, if you don't have refrigeration. And that's, you're going to mix one to one uh, with more brown sugar. Equal volume up? Huh? Yep. What's in the jar? One to one equal volume of brown sugar. And you're going to mix that in the jar. And you're gonna you're gonna pour it in. You're gonna mix it. You're gonna pour more in and mix it. And an easy way to do that, like if I wanted to super saturate this, and I wanted to go one to one, well, this is half full. So 
that much sugar would be one to one. So I'll just fill this up with sugar all the way to the top. And, and when this liquid comes up to here, we're at one to one, you know? And then you can stir that and it should be buoyant. What super saturation will show you buoyancy. So you put a, a wooden spoon in there and it'll kind of float. Or if you, you got it one to one and now you take a, a, mount, a little handful of brown sugar, you stick it on the top of this and uh, if it floats for a good 30 seconds to a minute before it submerges, you're super saturated too. So those are two signs. If a wooden spoon floats or if an iceberg of sugar will just sit on top and float. Now those are two signs that you've reached super saturation. And again, that's critical for storing your FBJ if you don't have a refrigerator. And that, that's basically FBJ right there. Any questions about that? How long can you store it for? Good, good question. Um, the storage time is uh, recommended a month in the refrigerator or super saturated. At that point, we feel as a community that your ferments start losing some of their power. Still viable, still usable up to two to three months, but you start decreasing in power. Same with the lactic acid bacteria, similar. So um, what, why I got jumped back into this is I wanted to segue back into the fruit vinegar, which you see here. So what that, what that is, that's a large scoby that's, that's formed naturally from the air, a fungal scoby. It's a breathable lid. And all I did was took a five gallon bucket and you can turn to the next page in your packet and that's the recipe for the fruit vinegar. So, I, so after um, I made my FPJ and I strained it, I have a five gallon bucket or a jar, whatever. And I put one third of uh, this is uh, leftovers, leftover FPJ material, right? Because we strained it and now you got a bunch of fruits or uh, grass or whatever sitting there. The, the vinegar is going to be best done with a sugary fruit. Mango makes good ones, star fruit makes good ones, bananas make good, uh, even though bananas are not a sugary fruit, but it's a good one to make, um, but you get the point. The grass might not make you a successful one, but then again, it might, you know. Um, a friend of mine uh, on Instagram named Mr. Microbe, who's responsible for all these cool drawings that we got in our packet, and he gave our class permission to use these recipes. He uh, made a really cool plumeria vinegar, and plumeria FPJ, which was edible after it was done fermenting, and then uh, he made a vinegar out of it. That one was amazing. But anyway, one third and then two thirds. So it's a, uh, right, yeah. Yeah, so it's basically one part water, I mean two parts water to one part left over. Right, and then one third air. Breathable lid. Like that picture there, that's a t-shirt. And you're just going to let that sit. Now, uh, what you can do is come with a vinegar you already made and inoculate it to make it go faster. Or you could use a live apple cider vinegar and inoculate it to make it go faster. And all you need is a splash. Um, here's two samples of a uh, banana vinegar. And you can see the scoby on top. And yeah, this is ready to, re this is ready to harvest. Basically, your look at vinegars, I believe, are under 2.4 pH and it's a true vinegar. How did I say that? Nice. Yeah, yeah. Under 2.4 and it's a true vinegar. And you could either pH test it or just start trusting your nose and your taste and you'll be able to taste it. This is also a, uh, a vinegar being made and you can see the layers of scoby. Something looks like a peach or something. Apricot or something, I don't know. These were gifted to us by a, a student that left the island. So great teaching material. You can see that white scoby. 
and um, I was talking to Claire, uh, Dane's lady, and um, something that, that I clued into while working with this and getting back to the ancient technologies, and it might not be appealing right now, but what do we know about this as a food source? Because they grow like three or four inches thick in the matter of like a month, and if you had this classroom full of buckets, you'd have enough meat to feed like a thousand people. So, I mean, I don't know exactly what the nutritional value of this giant fungus is, but what if it was high? What if it was high in protein or carbohydrates or trace minerals or micronutrients? And all of a sudden, no one has to be hungry ever again, even, even if Babylon clamped them down and ruined their food systems and ruined their village lifestyle and now they're all a third world country. Well, now we can start reinvigorating with, with uh, intelligence, you know, and uh, start feeding the masses. So yeah, that's what I talked to Claire about was she, uh, she brilliantly said, oh, make it into a fruit leather. And it's like, oh yeah, of course. Like you don't even recognize it at that point and it's already that texture and consistency. It's got the fruit in there that you farmed as well and high grade, you know. So yeah, um, that's the fruit vinegar. Any questions about that? How long does it uh, take? So that'll take about three months. One month if you activate it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it can go faster if you put the splash in there. Yeah. You'll start seeing a scoby real quick, actually, within two to three weeks so if you put if the you splash. Get, like, um, looks like like white powder, or, like like white, like little, not like a scoby. There was some kind of other fungus growing in there yeah, that wasn't probably. too desirable. Um, that was probably, I would say, due to the lid maybe not being sealed on there. The breathable lid not having a nice seal to it. Maybe some bigger uh, spores got in there of some other kind of fungus and started colonizing. colonizing. So uh, maybe just a nice t-shirt really sealed on there or even a paper bag or something where, where nothing can really penetrate would be a good place to start. Making sure you have your one-third airspace is another critical thing. A lot of times when I see funguses that I don't want growing is when I have the jar too full or too, too small, uh, too little in the, in the bucket. And that's when I'll see undesirable funguses start to grow. Good question. You can look on here. I'm not going to go over all the benefits, but you can look at all these benefits of just vinegar in your system alone. And that could even be ACV, apple cider vinegar, from the store. It could also be Master Cho has, has a recipe online for how to make brown rice vinegar. It's one of the hardest recipes. Most people don't do it because of the difficulty. But there is a brown rice vinegar recipe online. And there is a different enzymatic profile to grain vinegars versus fruit vinegars. Grain vinegars are a sought after profile in natural farming, but harder to obtain due to how easy it is to make fruit vinegar. How hard it is to get brown vinegar. Yeah, and the imported brown rice vinegar is cooked. Yeah. It's got other preservatives in it. But you can go to like an Asian store and uh, find brown rice vinegar and Hilo and stuff. So what, what I used to do is I like to make my like uh, WCP and WCA, which are, we're going to get to their extractions with vinegar. I used to like to make those with the, that bottled BRV. Uh, just because it was already cooked and stuff and there was no like live uh, scoby that would form But now I don't I don't even deal with it It's just a waste of driving and buying bottles I just make the fruit vinegar and if you're out of that like Costco has three dollar bottles like these bottles right here of uh, Apple cider vinegar the Kirkland brand live with the mother for three bucks a bottle, you know Any questions about the vinegar? We all good? Okay, the next ferment we're going to get to is the FAA. It's the fermented uh, fish amino acid, I think. Do I have that on the... N no, it's on like, I think, yeah, three more pages. It's got uh, the f fish amino on the top, and it also has the, the structure and the calcium. Fish amino acids critical for Hawaii because we got m massive access to, to um, awesome. materials, you know? Yeah. 
Fishermen are going out there every day. Fish are ending up on the sides of the road. Carcasses are ending up in landfills. Carcasses are ending up dumped in the bushes. But instead, we could uh, we can honor this, these animals that were sacrificed for their for their life, you know, for to feed us. And we can honor them by uh, by making ferment, uh, fermented fish amino acid. It's a super awesome byproduct of uh, something that would normally go to waste, and um, it's a fireball for your garden. And what I mean by that is an explosion of nitrogen. And that's why Drake here, who made this this pack or this uh, page, has a fuel can to show you that it's it's a fuel for your soil. It's a fuel for your microbes. It's like gas gets them going, gets them moving, heats them up. So if you ever have a stagnant compost pile in Hawaii, that's not too much of a problem, but you could spray it down with FAA and get it, get it firing, you know? So there's a, a lot of applications we can, we can use um, the FAA on. And this one, I was gonna go over direct replacements in this class for the grow store. Any formula or bottle that says grow on it, is usually a fish hydrosolate or a fish uh, emulsion. This is highly superior to both of those. Those are, are really nasty byproduct industries of the fishing industry. And they're, they're, if you knew what went into making fish hydrosolate or emulsion, you would never buy it. Um, there's a really cool podcast I'll turn you on to. It's called uh, The Science of Cannabis Cultivation. Um, hosted by KISS Organics, K-I-S, KISS Organics. And if that, that podcast is great for cannabis farming. So definitely tune in, especially the earlier episodes. The ones he's doing now are a little boring, but he does one on fish hydrosolate. And this guy, he doesn't understand Korean natural farming, the host, but he's all about like uh, organic growing and stuff. But he, he tells you, you listen to that episode and, it's, and he's trying to tell you why to use fish hydrosolate, but what you'll take away from it is why not to use it and why this is a superior product. So um, just to break that down real quick and then I'll show you some that's in action right now actually. This is an FAA right here and, and also can also turn to a Turn to vinegar pretty, e I mean, uh, alcohol pretty easily. To me, this one's a little fishy, but still really good though. But it does have a, this one has more of a fishy smell than, uh, than they usually do. You can look at this too, if you guys wanna come up at your leisure. And uh, this is basically a bucket of, of uh, fish amino acids in action. So those are, those are uh, heads of fish right there. Oh no, it looks like this one's all set up. And if you smell it, this is more, more the smell we're going for, like a sweet fishy smell, almost like a miso fish soup smell. It shouldn't smell rotten. Of course it's gonna be fishy, it's fishy, but it's not rotten or stinky. I mean, you could, are obviously argue that's stinky, but like it's not stinky like, like ugh, I don't want to smell that. Yeah, it's not decay or death, right? It's life. It's life, right? And so this this we're not going to seal either. It breathes through this, uh, just not having it all the way down. And um, we'll go over that recipe right now. I have a question. Yep. Do you take off? Do you um, wash the fish line off? No. Nope. So you want to leave all the blood, the guts intact or I mean not intact, but into your into it there and you don't want to wash it either because the sea water and the minerals found on the outside we're going for also. We're going to extract all that sea water, the microbial life that was attached to that fish is all going to go into this recipe. So when they cut it and you take the head off and all of that's going to attach it off. Yep. So usually when yeah, usually when they gut the fish and they, they take those big fillets and then you just got that carcass with the gut still hanging sometimes or may might be on the side. What I usually do is I'll since I don't like to handle the fish too much myself, some people will actually bring it out on a table and chop it into pieces with like a real sharp knife or a butcher knife or something. But what I do and, and we did it the other day in a class out here 
is um, is all like say I had like an ahi this big and I was doing it into a larger bucket than this is I would put the um, sugar on the bottom and then just stick the head in there pack that with sugar and then kind of just keep breaking the, the spine so it like kind of um, folds on itself mm -hmm. so you can keep folding it on itself until you get to the tail and that would be the last fold and every time you fold it you just layer more brown sugar I'll show you right now and that's the easiest way because you don't even touch the thing you can have a glove and you can just pick up its tail stick the head in the bucket pack it break it over pack it with more brown sugar break it over and that's what's showing you right here is what I'm about to show you on the board you can, for a five gallon bucket for like all those size heads, how many heads in one tooth? Like, like in a five, this would probably take a small Ono carcass would fill that whole bucket. Okay. One small Ono. So what I like to do it in the best are those, uh, the coolers that are for like uh, sports teams or like construction site cooler, the, the orange ones, the igloo coolers, the water cooler. Those are the best because they have, you can screw the lid on where it's, it's basically bug proof, but they have this little vent hole for when you, you know, so the air goes in for the, so the water flows. So that vent hole is enough space for the microbes to come in and do their thing. And, not, and then it keeps out every other living organism. So the igloo cooler is, is the best with this lid on it. And um, the best by far is the cool, the cooler tech is the best by far five gallon bucket if you have to but it's hard to get a sealed it's hard to get a sealed breathable lid on this bucket because of all these ridges and stuff like that usually you got to bring the cloth down here and then put a rubber band around it and you don't it's just a little bit harder so this this uh, water cooler is the best sugar and then like say that fish head was in here and then you then you pack the pack the sugar in here again and then its tail was coming up like this you know and basically what I'd do is I'd break its back over so so then it layers down like that and then I could put more sugar break this one back that way put more sugar and so forth until you get to one-third air space on top right for the fermentation you got that lid on there set it and forget it you come back three months later or actually you come back two days later take the lid off smell it if you're getting a foul odor you need to put a sugar cap on the top and you can even put a sugar cap to begin with and what I mean by sugar cap is like a good two to three inches of just sugar on the very top. And within about three or four days, you're going to see that a lot of liquid has come and that sugar cap has kind of sunk into it. And now maybe your fish carcass might be floating in liquid. You might need to put a stone on top to hold it down. Because you want that, you want the carcass below the brine, you know, below the liquid, just like uh, sauerkraut. And then, um, like you guys saw in that bucket, how much was in there. That's, that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of uh, product right there in one bucket, you know. So, uh, you check that in two days, it stinks like rot, you do another sugar cap. You keep doing a sugar cap till you don't smell any rot. The reason why you did that, that, that was happening is you didn't start with enough sugar. You're, you're basically your sugar to fish ratio is one to one. Sugar to fish ratio is one to one by weight, not by volume. FPJ, we are one to one by, by volume. So if I had a pile of, of plants and a pile of sugar, I could just mix them together. But now we're going by weight. So that carcass might be a good 25 pounds. You're going to need a whole 25 pound bag of sugar to compensate for that. And uh, the reason why it might, it might not be set right right away and you got to add more is that you're adding so much sugar, you're like, man, that's got to be enough. But it's, it wasn't enough and you got to add more. It really does eat a lot of sugar to make this recipe. Any questions about FAA?
what would you prefer on uh, fish species? Okay, good, great question. Master Cho says blue back deep sea fish or mid range fish. And what he means by that is like. Um, Aku, uh, opelu. Yeah, opelu. Mackerel. Yeah. The mackerel family. That mid range, the high grade fish that the natives actually went for the most. That, that's the one you want. Big to eye, eat. big eye tuna. A lot of the fatty tunas, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And deep sea over a reef. Mid, mid range over a reef. You know? Alua. Alua, high grade. Uh, any of the any of those those uh, real high grade edible fish are gonna make really good FAA. And anything that wouldn't be a desirable edible fish wouldn't make good FAA. Like if you added someone speared a bunch of tang and those black things, you know, like those aren't gonna make the best FAA. You can trout, you can salmon, you can, but none of them compare to ocean fish, deep sea, mid range ocean fish. And that. Uh, I was just going to say, what's a FAA replacement if it's like uh, still uh, firm? Still brewing? Yeah, still brewing. An FAA replacement? Or like the soil treatment solution. Right, right, to get a soil treatment going. Um, I mean, at that point, like your FAA is basically your high nitrogen and it's like your microbial fuel source. So, I mean, you know, if you didn't have that, basically you just don't have that. <laughs> um, some FPJ though, that's a, like a high nitrogen FPJ could help with some of the nitrogen uh, and that would come from grasses and stuff like that. Um, you could also, just trying to think, uh, something super high in nitrogen, you know, like... Dragonfly Earth Medicine 1B, like their version of it, would be, that be a good alternative? Like an open air fermented, uh, yeah, so I mean, that, that would be, those open air ferments, the reason that they're doing those is to extract nutrients from the plant matter that's in there, right? So they're, you're composting that plant material into water and you're letting the microbes leach and, and uh, metabolize those nutrients to make them available for your plant. The same process would be making the FPJ. If you could compare anything to a Dragonfly Earth Medicine tea and why they're doing that would be an FPJ. Because you're breaking down and extracting the nutrients out of the, the plant material you used. So the same thing, like if you made one of those and you wanted it high nitrogen, you'd use high nitrogen products like grass, shoots, uh, fresh uh, uh, banana stalks, um, anything that has that fast vigor, comfrey, Anything that's like got that, that nitrogen, fast growing vibration, that would be the, the correlation of, of why those guys are making the fermented water compost is the same reason why you'd make an FPJ. Would be the direct kind of correlation between those two, you know? I hope that, that helps you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably, something will hit me though uh, during, during the day here that, that'll be like a good, Super heavy pigeon nitrogen pea replacement. Pigeon What's that? Pigeon pea. Pigeon pea um, you know the tips of pigeon pea you can make an FPJ from. Yeah, you could even use the fresh uh, pods if you wanted to to make one. Yeah. And that, that would be like a, like say you use those pods, that would be like a finishing, you know, telling it. And say you were a, say you're a cannabis seed producer, well you can make FPJs and stuff out of seeding flowers and stuff that would, would help you signal your plant to seed. You know. Um, okay, FAA. Just working our way down these. This is going to take the longest part of the class. Will be to go through these nine elements. And again, this is a very, very brief and overall view. Um, in a proper K and F course, I would take at least two days. One day would be to explain all these, and then another day would be to make every single one of them. Today, we're going to briefly go over all the nine. And then after lunch, we're going to make a few of them. Have you ever used FAA in like uh, your, your food, like stir fries and stuff like that? Um, I personally don't eat the fish, but it's a great replacement for fish sauce. Yeah. So if you put fish sauce in your cooking or you're used to Asian cooking with fish sauce, that's usually made in a very rude, crude way where this is going to be live way more flavorful, probiotic, 
high grade food flavoring. So yeah, it can be used for that as well. Um, let's try to get through these because it is already catching up on time. The lab, um, if you flip to, where was that lab? I think it was a little bit before the fruit vinegar, right after the fruit vinegar. Yeah, one before. The LAB, the lactic acid bacteria. Um, we'll just go over this one real quick. Lab, again, is your emergency workers. Lab is your, uh, what uh, Drake calls your police force or your military force or kind of more like your doctors and stuff that would come to, to help a, a situation that went bad, you know? Yeah, your, your aides, you know, your, um, your soldiers, you know, your, your, main, your main guys and girls. Right here is a, a lab that I pulled out of my refrigerator. You don't really want it to be out of the fridge for too long, but I brought it just for the class. And you could pass that around and give it a smell. This one is, is starting to lean a little towards uh, cheesy, a little more than I want it to be. But anyway, again, just to tune your nose into where you're looking is for this really nice, cheesy smell. And uh, the recipe is on here. What you're gonna do is you're gonna make rice wash water and you're gonna ferment that and, and uh, collect it with a breathable lid, breathable lid for two to three days. Um, if you look at this little picture here, basically what you're gonna see is, is three layers. And once you got those three layers, you have your inoculant for your milk. So that top layer you're not gonna use, that's kinda like these floaties and stuff, and the bottom is the sediment. And then in the middle, will be like a milky looking, it almost looks like that lab, and it's called a rice wash water. Fermented rice wash water. And you're gonna use that to inoculate milk one to 10. And that's step two, uh, breathable lid, two thirds full. After, uh, after two to four days, you'll get a separation occurs where the curds from the milk will rise to the top They'll be, I don't think I have any pictures of that. Um, they have, that'll be your cheese. It'll be like a big block of cheese, basically. And you could feed that to your animals. My dog loves it. You can also make cheese out of it, human consumption grade cheese. Anyway, you're looking for that serum that's underneath the cheese. It's a yellow serum, and that's gonna be your lab. So once you, once you uh, collect the lab, you can refrigerate it, like the one that's going around has been or you can again super saturate it like the FPJ and store it outside the refrigerator. Um, these are fully edible, high grade for the belly, it's an inoculation. Um, if we could just talk real quick about lactic acid bacteria, one of the most prevalent microbes in the Milky Way, right? Um, you can kind of see these guys here, the medic, you know, emergency worker. A, uh, a baby comes into this world through its mother's uh, canal passageway, boom, it's coated with lactic acid bacteria from the head all the way to its feet as it comes into the world. Uh, right now as we speak, lactic acid bacteria is around our lips, around our ears, our eyes, our armpits. It's, it's in there cleaning, helping uh, anything that would be like a stink they're helping keep that at bay. Um, for chicken coops, pig pens, this is, can be used as a spray to help mitigate uh, stink. And even that cheesy smell, when you spray it, you might smell that cheese at first, but that'll go away within a few hours and the pig and chicken poop smell will go away. So a lot of uh, KNF has to do with animal husbandry and lab is a great one of the ingredients in, uh, in keeping those smells at bay and the, the, the odorless pig pens that Master Cho is famous for. Um, it, would, you not, just, would you need to super saturate it if you were putting it in the fridge? Would you want no. It? Okay. Mm -mm. Okay. it could last longer if you did, but... Yeah, the fri I like to do, if you have space, refrigerator is definitely ideal for all these things, for the ferments, but if you don't have space, super saturation is critical. Um, not too many of Master Cho's recipes call for lab. It's mainly um, soil foundation and if you have a, a disturbance. 
in your agriculture system, like a like a uh, gnarly wind comes through and everything's kind of looking a little tattered. Spray it down with some lab. It'll help strengthen it back up. Uh, helps with powdery mildew. Stuff like that, because it's alive. Any other questions about lab? I guess is there any certain kind of milk that is? That's a good question. Store-bought milk works just fine. Raw milk has an extra layer of like fat, I believe. Yeah, fat on it that needs to be skimmed as it's being created. Um, goat milk works. Mother's milk is great for human consumption. Um, so plant-based milks. Yeah, I've, I've done experiments with coconut milk, and someone else has done experiments with oat milk. And both of the, any any milk works at this point. Before these experiments were done, people said just to use cow milk. But now the experiments have been done. Microscope work's been done. Oat milk has been verified to cr produce really nice strains of lactic acid bacteria. Um, last time Drake was here and we were talking about that, he said be careful though because the profile of lactic acid bacteria will be different depending on the type of milk. So not only, not only is it lab, but within lab we got so many subsets of what lab is, you know, of different, I want to say species of lab, but different variations of lab. So each milk will, will bring up a different set. And he was just saying like, well, Master Cho's recipe calls for the milk set, you know. What's in that jar? What did you make? This one was a, with a milk. Organic. A store bought organic milk. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Actually, it was just the metal gold, like uh, the local milk. Before it closed down. Or just whatever one you can get that has a, the smiley face on it. I don't know, whatever. Yeah, David made some with his wife's breast milk. Yeah, the breast milk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that would be more one I'd be into consuming and stuff like that myself, you know what I mean? But, um, How just. Often do you say? Um, as much as uh, weekly, yeah, weekly it would be the recommendation for a situation like that, you, you or as needed. In their water, like you said, put this in our water, you can get the chickens and the ducks, yeah. feed them a little bit in the water. Sweet. It's a good and you can read over this too on some of the other uh, benefits and whatnot. Okay, we're going to move on to, uh, to IMOs. Basically, the most important, the most important uh, element of natural farming would be the IMOs, indigenous microorganisms. These uh, this is some IMO two right here that can whoa. I just pulled it out of the lab today. This is kind of an old one, actually. I want to. I would probably want to use this, but it does have a good smell to it still. So I'll pass it around. Um, this is IMO two. Okay. Maybe for like other things other than the cast Yeah, I mean, it just it's it's that that thing's like a year old. So yeah, it's not. It's still though. It's still in the pocket. It might have a little alcohol smell to it, but it's in the pocket though of a good smelling IMO two. Um, I love to use these to catch my IMO one, a hollow basket. Master Cho talks about a cedar basket, a cedar box with holes in it, and there's recipes or uh, guides for his boxes online. How much holes do you need in the box? Um, they, I think he just does like a, a row of holes around like a certain height on it. He even slits the bottom. He, he parts the bottom. So it has like a little slit in the, in the Under. In between it. Yeah, yeah. yeah the bottom so all the microbes are coming from the pieces. Nice, yeah. It basically, you just want accessibility for the microbes to get in there, you know? You don't want to try to cut them off. You want to get paths open for them to, but they'll find a way too, as long as it's accessible and not sealed. And anyway, same same principles with your putting out your collection. It's, it's a two-thirds full. Pack, uh, semi packed down, you don't want it packed down, but two thirds full. It's uh, In the end, it's gonna look like uh, tempeh. You'll pick up this block that's in here and the, the rice will look like tempeh. And you're gonna use hard cooked rice 
Let's see, let's turn to that page in here. I think it's more in the front of the packet. Yeah, so um, this, this right here is a, shows you IMO 1 through 5, and that's the process that this is the most important process in Korean natural farming. The thing about making IMO is you need most of the nutrients, the other core nutrients, to be able to produce it. IMO 1, which we're talking about right now, is uh, right here, and you could, I'll just briefly go through this. You can see this picture here is a one-third space, hard-cooked rice, the air space, and then you go to an undisturbed location near your farm in an apex forest, ideally, or an old fruit tree or orchard grove that you haven't been to in at least a year or more. Um, if you see fungal hyphae underneath the layers of leaves, even better. If you see mushrooms sprouting out of logs, even better. So just use your intuition. Is this a vibration that, that is the ancient microbes that I'm looking for? These ancient intelligent microbes that I'm looking for? Like you can see here, you're, you're collecting them. IMO1, they're like babies, and then we're gonna take them through this fermentation stage to make them into enlightened masters. And th those are the guys, remember when Drake was here, that we just need 5% good guys out there to influence the other 80% of neutral microbes. So this, 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 like he said, this white isn't really the target microbe that we're looking for. We're looking for this very little percentage, which is in, the white is an indicator that you have these ancient intelligent microbes in that catch. The white fluff is just a great indicator that you're on the right track. You can look here at a failure at something semi-acceptable and correct. I personally always aim for correct. The semi-acceptable is what most people get. Failure, you just didn't follow directions. You did something completely wrong. Acceptable is what most people get because they're not using their feels. You know, they're not, they're not tuning in. They're just kind of going by the instructions. If you tune in, you'll always get this one. And what I mean by that is find that Find that spot in the old growth forest. Find that spot on your property that's the vibes, you know, that's the moist and there's, there's fertility around, there's worms, there's, you know, or you're out in the Ohia forest and there's actually a layer of, of leaf duff on the ground that has created layers of soil and you can feel that and see that. Um, hard cooked is gonna be critical. Leaving it overnight in the refrigerator I've found is critical in Hawaii. Maybe not necessary in a drier climate but uh, letting it cool down and even leaving it overnight in the refrigerator dehydrates it even more for a more successful catch. IMO2, if you turn the page, you're just gonna add one to one by volume of brown sugar. So it's basically you're making an FPJ out of your uh, IMO1 is literally what you're doing. You're just mixing it with brown sugar and that's the IMO2 that got passed around. Um, it has like, a, and yet you'll do that with a breathable lid if you look on here, a good natural farmer collects uh, IMO. And then right here on this page too, I want you to put IMO, I want you to put a two next to that. So you don't get thrown off by the wording. And then on this page, I want you to put a one on this page so you know that it's IMO one. And so the IMO two and that, like how you can see is like this guy's got He's got IMO from the forest, he's got some from the Malco forest, some from his bamboo patch, dry season, bamboo patch, wet season, he's got some from his banana patch. So then when he goes to make his IMO3, he can have diverse culture to inoculate the IMO3. The IMO3 will look like this, there's two. Make sure you label with uh, the, your date, where you got it from. This one was from the Ohia in South Kona on, the, on uh, December 21st. You're gonna make IMO3. You'll follow this process here. It's basically you're gonna use wheat mill run or rice bran is the best. And uh, if you can find organic, even better. Um, there's alternatives, obviously, 
when you find an alternative, everybody wants to come up with alternatives, but they have to match the profile of a rice bran. And what I mean by that is a fat, protein, carbohydrate needs to be balanced in order to be a good substrate for IMO3. People have used all kinds of stuff, milled mac nuts um, with the shells and, the, and some fruit still in there, some, some nuts still in there to add fat to the pile. Um, all kinds of stuff depending on where you are because everyone's like, well, we want it to be bioregional. But don't, don't think like that as far as, you want to master these recipes first. I mean, of course, think like that, but you don't, you don't want to go too far astray from the recipe until you got it, then experiment, then bring in, because you know what you're looking for. You don't know if you made it on, uh, on sugar cane pulp, if, if what you're looking at is the right thing or that's the right smell until you've done it the right way. So uh, it's just a process of fermentation. This chart right here shows where uh, day, day one through 10, and this is a graph of it heating up. And um, it shows if you didn't flip it, it might get too hot in the middle. It'll get to 160 failure. You want it right at 120. So this graph down here, this blue line is showing how each day the farmer came out, took the temperature and then flipped the pile to keep it at that temperature. And if you find that your pile goes too hot, you can spread it thin and it'll cool down pile it back up, get it right in that 120 pocket. We're not going to spend too much time on this, but I do want you to study this sheet right here, which will show you why we're doing this. Collecting the IMO1, a diverse culture from the forest, making it into IMO2, IMO2, t stable and preserved, all those microbes, we're using it to make IMO3, it's kind of like the microbes are at school, IMO3, is now we're getting fungal propagation. We're propagating those, those high grade uh, microbes, those five percenters that we wanted, that we collected in the IMO1, and they're graduating college in that process. IMO4 is when we actually bring field soil. So different soils from around your property, if you're growing in a, uh, in a, a medium, like a um, soilless growing mix for your cannabis, you would bring that in there to make uh, IMO4. Um, and then IMO5 is a super compost. Most people don't really go that far with it, but if you do, that's when you would add all your, say you were making a, a cannabis bed and you're gonna plan it on putting kelp and neem cake and all that stuff in there. Well, you could, you, you could put that in your IMO5 ahead of time and break it all down and make it bioavailable to your plants. Okay, any questions about that? I know I know like a lot of questions like this is a really fast tracked version of KNF, but um, these questions are all answerable through a direct message to me online. Also on YouTube, there's a guy named Chris Trump who does uh, film tutorials of all these and he, he's really easy to um, understand. So if you ever have a question, you could either hit me up or go to YouTube and watch the video and be able to pause right where you need to and backtrack if you're uh, wondering about these recipes. Extractions would be our WCA and our WCP. And those, uh, we're hopefully gonna do one after class. That's uh, the bones, oh nice, we got one right here. So we got the bones that are charred. Make sure they're black and charred. We don't want them burnt to white. We want them burnt to black. And then we add them uh, one to 10 or more with vinegar. And uh, you'll get some slight bubbling reaction, but really the uh, phosphorus kind of looks more like this, uh, kind of like a, um, you can see it almost kind of separate from the bone after a while. And it's kind of this kind of ghosty looking stuff that comes on there. The bubbles are the calcium dissolving into vinegar, and that's why when we make a WCA, which is this one here, you get a big bubbly reaction. If you've seen anybody's natural farming videos of like a big, like how we used to put baking soda and vinegar as children and make little volcanoes, it's the same principle. It's the vinegar reacting to the calcium and creating bubbles. So that's made with either um, eggshells. If you eat eggs, it's a great way to make it, or what I have here is um, crushed coral. You can also use oyster shells. Bean shells. 
Oh, oh PE shells. Oh, shells. Crab, the crab shells and stuff also have lots of calcium, but they also can contain chitin. So that's another recipe, of the same exact recipe, but using crab shells or shrimp shells to make a chitin extract, which feeds fungal life too. So these are extracts. We're going to extract them into vinegar. We're going to extract phosphorus and calcium into vinegar, water soluble, directly available to the microbe and the plant. So that's what's awesome about those. Um, the, let's go over this last couple here. Any questions about the extracts? Um, for like, if you're using fish bones, would you want old ones or is new ones fine? Yeah, so if you're going to use any new bone, you want to boil it first and then you want to dry it. So new bones need to be boiled and dried before you char them. What's your process of charring them? So what I like to do, my favorite is using these uh, old cow bones that you can find in a pasture. And the reason being is that all the organic matter is already gone. So there's no boiling or drying. It's just pure calcium phosphate sitting in a shape, you know. So I like to use these, and I, the, obviously this one's pretty big. I could, I could do this one by itself, and uh, I was going to bring them today, but I actually ran over them with my Kubota. With, there are these, these two um, rocket um, charcoal starters. You guys familiar with those? Yeah. The rocket can charcoal starters you can get from Ace Hardware. And what you do is you buy two of those, and you bend the bottom of one of them so it can fit into the other one. And so you have them stacked. And the bottom one, you create a nice uh, hot fire that has some nice hardwood charcoals in it. Um, or you could even use like store-bought. Even these work, even though they're not the best, but they work. And um, uh, you just char it. So you're going to want to watch it. So this side will char. You can dump it out, flip it over. It'll start to char, flip it over again. And then at some point, it'll be real brittle. And you can just kind of break it. And if a lot of it's still white on the inside, you can continue to char it. So if you do have a biochar, if you have a biochar thing, throw it in there. you could yeah, you could literally just stick this in the middle of your biochar heater until the thing turns black, you know, and then just dump it out and then use it. Yeah, I think that'd be even more ideal. I think there's a little bit of mystery behind this one. The American translations they just char it real fast, but if you read Cho's book. And the, and the thing is, this was translated by his daughter, who's not a farmer. So she just did like word for word Korean translation, but she's not a farmer. So a lot of people said she missed subtleties in this book. But one thing that I pick up on is it says a low, hot fire. And to me, that sounds like biochar. Yeah. But then when any, any of the teachers before me who have taught this recipe, they just char it real fast. I, I do too, I do too. So I think you're onto something there. Okay, um, yeah, so critical. Those two are critical though. I think they're often overlooked in natural farming. These two are, are what's the most lacking from a, from a food agriculture system. Nitrogen's easy, bacteria's easy. These things are easy, but phosphorus, not so easy. It's only in some plants and to get it bioavailable is kind of hard. Calcium, every system needs calcium. Pretty much every, especially uh, new soils that haven't been sitting around and that aren't old bottoms of ocean beds like you have in the mainland that used to be oceans and they got plenty of calcium in the soil. Not, not the case for new soils, for islands and stuff. Not so much calcium, you know. So we need a lot of calcium in our, in our systems. Um, the last one being the sea, the SEA, which is just ocean water. Um, if you look at the last, I think it's the last page, yeah, the last page in this packet. It has the diluted seawater. So you can literally, next time you're at the beach, bring a five gallon bucket and just grab a, grab a five gallon bucket of ocean water. What you're going to get is every element known to man like we talked about. A few other things that it does, it flocculates dead and compact soil. So it'll actually start mineralizing and flocculating, it's called, and basically means to fluff the soil. It'll start breaking the layers apart to be able to let moisture in. Um, there's, on the bottom here, you have a fruit ripening guide using seawater. 
Um, in the old uh, uh, sugar industries, they used to harvest all the sugar and then spray it down with Roundup after they harvested it. And what that would do is, it would, because the Roundup is a form of salt, it would, it would cause stress and cause the sugars to all kind of come to the surface and get more gnarly in there. The sugars would, because it's trying to protect itself. So the same thing, you can trick your fruit, fruit trees or your cannabis into expressing more sugars, terpenes, essential oils by using the sea, wa the sea water uh, recipe right here, the enhanced fruitening recipe, uh, enhanced ri ripening recipe. And that's just one to 30 straight sea water. One to 30, if you don't have access to the ocean, like I said, this, I, would, I would go for something like this more than just sea salt from a store. It's called C90 and it's from the Cortez, the Sea of Cortez, which is known for its high mineral content. And um, also non-cooked salt. Most salt you buy in the store is cooked. This one's not cooked, so it has all the microbes in it. And look, so this is a product that someone sells, right, worldwide. And right on the front it says, 100% natural, waterable, soluble nutrients. Energize your soil and improve microbial activity. Created naturally from solar dehydrated ocean water, known to contain more than 90 minerals and trace elements and 50,000 organic compounds. So that, that's, this is the company selling their product, what they put on their bag, you know? So that's just a testament to uh, the, the knowledge of Master Cho and what he's bringing to the table with, these, uh, with the ocean water and you don't gotta second guess it because it's proven. Um, all right, it's getting a little bit into the day here. I'm sure you guys are getting hungry and stuff. We're gonna, should we go over the garden setup quick or do you wanna do it after lunch? Okay, let's do it. So garden basics. So, that, so I'm going to walk you through like if I were going to start a cannabis garden. Um, just to touch real quick, this was Dragonfly Earth Medicine. They came and we were drinking some OHN and stuff. And uh, the reason why I included their picture in here is, uh, is these guys are really famous in the cannabis world. And um, they're really famous in the cannabis world. And the, the reason why they're really famous is because they brought natural farming to the cannabis world at a bigger consciousness. Uh, what I mean by spreading it to a lot of people through their Instagram and through their, uh, their, their podcasting and traveling around the world, teaching their methods. Um, a friend of mine called these guys because he got hired to work on a cannabis farm in Oregon when it was first popping off and they wanted to grow an acre of high grade cannabis. And so he called Dragonfly Earth Meta and said, hey, I need some of your products, because they make products, right? They make these powdered minerals and powdered uh, fl uh, flower essences and, and alfalfa meals and stuff. Anyway, he says, I want to buy some of your products. The products are very expensive. They're inoculated with really high-grade uh, microbe, lab-grown microbes. And uh, these guys were like, no, man, you, you don't want to buy our product to feed an acre. But what you do want to do is study this guy named Master Cho that's probably where you want to start. And so anyway, um, my friends started this cannabis farm in Oregon and they did, crushed it. It was called Pudding, Puddington River Farms. And they crushed it and they biorimated the soil and they, they grew right in the soil. And um, it was just all through these guys suggesting Master Cho um, as a go-to cheap source. So what we're going to talk about now is growing high-grade cannabis as medicine, as a uh, as um, empowerment, as a, a community uh, community binder, you know this is the the, the healing plant, the magical plant, the uh, the cure all, the uh, and uh, the reason why we use KNF is because we want high end products, we want high end hash, edibles, um, we don't want that low grade stuff, you know. We don't want the. We don't want to be able to. We don't want to smoke the product and be like, oh yeah, you used uh, Botanic Care to grow that. Oh yeah, that's your Earth Juice. Yeah, I can taste that in there. No, no, no. We want to taste the essence of the plant. We want the plant to express itself. 
we don't want to try to control its expression. We want to help it develop its expression. And that's what KNF does. So you're going to set up a lab. This is, a, this is my KNF lab at home. These are all buckets of, of uh, FAA, of FPJs. You can see some vinegar in the back. Some, this is WCA, WCP. And just kind of showing you guys some inspiration how easy it is. Just go set up a Costco tent or throw up a little, a little carport and get going. Buckets of FAA brewing. Okay, so we're kind of past this in today's teaching. We're going to go into the cannabis setup. Right here you can see like a, a feeding trough next to the greenhouse, right? So it's all about making stuff easy, accessible. We want to set up a system we don't have to mess with that much. We want it to be set. So, so right here I have my feeding trough. I have an over four foot drop here which aerates the water as it falls. So that's a free way to oxygenate without a pump or anything. You just, at least a four foot drop will oxygenate your water. And I'll just come here and I'll fill this with my KNF nutrients for the day. And I'll put a sump pump in there with a hose and I'll water the garden or even advanced you could have an irrigation system that then pumps this trough of nutrients and feeds your garden. So gardening basics 101 we did in our uh, growing food in Hawaii class. Air, sunlight, water, food, right? We need proper airflow. We need proper sunlight. We're not going to stick our cannabis patch between two big giant clumps of bananas, right? We're not going to stick our cannabis patch on a on a uh, on. So so we just got to we got to tune into nature. Where does the wind come? It comes down and up the mountain. It doesn't go sideways on the mountain, unless we have a hurricane or something. Every other time, every single day, the wind goes up and down the mountain. Every day up and down the mountain. So are you going to put your greenhouse closed off to that wind flow? Or are you going to put your greenhouse so it flows through it? So these are the things we need to, to keep in mind. Um, I used the car analogy last, last few weeks ago when we did this. Uh, an old mechanic told me a car needs uh, air, fuel, uh, spark, water, or something, you know? So those basics to run a car is the basics to run a garden, you know? Air, fuel, water, spark, you know, spark. So, so we, we, we got these, you know, go to your property and stand there. Think about a plant sitting, okay, my plant's gonna sit here 24 hours a day, every single day. Is it getting enough sunlight, water, airflow? How am I gonna feed it? Um, location, south facing, you're obviously not gonna try to set up a greenhouse that uh, gets pure shade in the morning and pure shade throughout the day. So if your house is here and the, uh, the sun is setting like this, this is your south facing. So here's the ocean down here. This is south facing. So if the sun's going like this over my house, I gotta set up my greenhouse over here, not on this side of my house. If I set it up on this side, it's gonna be blocked by my house half the day, you know, or the majority of the day. So those things are important. A lot of people call me, uh, man, I don't know why my, my thing's not successful. I'll go to their house and go, bro, the thing's in the shade. You're only getting two hours of sunlight the whole day. Besides that, it's in the shade. You, the thing's not going to survive, you know? Um, soil, living soil is key, right? We went over this in the class, the one-third mix. The, uh, do you want to go over that again, the one-third soil mix? You guys want to talk about that at all? Living soil blend. A uh, little bit. Moss. Yeah, so for living soil is we're going we're gonna to go with our basic one-third mix. So we're not going to go and buy the bag of stuff from the store, or you could if that's the only route you got, but we're going to try to go one-third compost, one-third cinder, and one-third peat moss. Um, to this, you know, we want biochar, rock dust, rock dust. 
we want some kind of uh, like a calcium carbonate and we want uh, could always throw whatever your kelp or your neem in there if you want to really just kick it up for your cannabis Like right, so a lot of these things you could you could eliminate from your mix too if you're planning on supplementing K and F more heavily, you know. But this is a basic living soil blend. What makes it alive is this, and then you're gonna add this. Worm castings as much as you have or as much as you can afford. One or the other. You can go up to 20% worm castings and, and best, you know, if you can get up to that ratio, 20%. Um, what also is going to make it living is they're going to start treating it with compost teas. We did that class last week. Uh, compost teas, worm casting teas, and your soil foundation, K and F, which we're going to go over right now. Soil foundation. So I got my, uh, my bed of living soil all set up. I've uh, come through, <clears throat> made sure it's, everything is in there, my biochar, my rock dust, so I know everything's alive. I could just give it water and it'll be good. Everything else I do now is just an enhancement, you know? That's how, that's what, that's how good we want our soil is that we could just give it water and we're still gonna have some of the highest grade on the island, you know? So uh, just through the teas and the inoculations. So that's what we're looking for. Living soil, KNF, IMO, teas, worm castings, compost. That's where your life is coming from. Microbes. And then we're gonna do our husbandry and keep it alive. So that means we're not gonna let it dry out to the bone because then we lost half of our microbes. We're not gonna let it um, we're not going to let it uh, uh, be uncovered for long periods of time because then we're charring off our microbes. So we lay down the, we lay down the soil, <coughs> we prep the bed, and then we got our, our uh, already in our nursery, we got our clones or our seedlings or our, uh, our crop of choice, right? That's our, our worm castings that we inoculated the beds with. So we have our clones, we got our crop of choice, and now we're going to plant them into that bed, right? It could be a pot, it could be a, a container garden, whatever, whatever you're growing in. I want, I want to suggest uh, thinking about root space, though, when you're growing cannabis. I think that's a lot overlooked a lot is root space. So I like to plant in the ground. I like to plant in big smart pots or big garden beds. <clears throat> We're going to create habitat around our, our greenhouse or our plot, right? So, th so what I mean by habitat is we're going to incorporate border plants like comfrey and lemongrass. We're going to use cover crop seed. So we got our, our living soil bed or pot set up. What next? Step two is we're going to throw down cover crop. And we're going to stick our clone in the ground. Keeping in mind we've already set up an environment around our, uh, around our patch. So right here is an example of what I just said. These are small little plants right here. Probably two or three feet tall. There's another row of them there. These are he uh, mounds of soil here with logs around them. This is our cover crop seed that was already sown all growing up so no weeds are growing only beneficial plants and this is also creating uh, biodiversity with the root exudates that are going into the ground it's, it's keeping the root surface porous 
and open with the roots all inter exchanging in there. And it's also going to be my first food source for my plants as I chop and start dropping this cover crop onto the ground to feed these plants. So my cover crop is growing up. It gets like four to six inches. My cannabis plants are growing. I'm going to come in there and chop everything down. And now I'm going to start paying attention to what, how, what size do I want these plants <clears throat> when they finish. Because a, a cannabis plant grows another half to two-thirds more than it did when you, when you stopped vegetating it. And so are, are we all pretty familiar with photo period and cannabis? If you, wanna, if you want a cannabis plant to stay vegetating and not flower, you have to put supplemental lights on it in Hawaii. That's the only way it's going to work or else it's going to start flowering right away. Meaning if you, if you take the clone out of the lights, it'll just start flowering. Even if it's that big, it'll just start flowering. Uh, a seedling, if you have any kind of indica or 90 day wonder strain or anything, it'll grow about that big and start flowering. So in order to get away from that happening, we need supplemental lights or tropical strains that are used to the photo periods of the tropics, like a sativa that's going to grow tall before it starts flowering just because it's genetic coding. Those are hard to find and hard to come by nowadays because nobody smokes sativa that much anymore, or land race varieties. Um, so you got to have a projection of the future in your mind. How big are these plants going to be? because I don't want them touching the roof up here when they're trying to put on big chunky flowers, right? Or, or touching the side of my greenhouse over there. So I need to, to keep that in mind as I'm vegging them up with those lights on. So personally what I'll do is I'll, I'll set up a greenhouse like this and then I'll string lights up. So you got the lights shining when you want them. Turn them off when you want them to flower, right? So these ones, the lights have been off probably for about three or four weeks, probably about three weeks and they got the first sign of, uh, of flower and bud formation, right? You see all the bud sites? So lights on for veg, and you get them to desired size, turn off the lights. We're doing our K and F sprays every 10 days, depending if they're vegging, crossover, or flowering. And we're using IPM, Integrated Pest Management, using our senses to tell what they need. In Hawaii, the biggest problems are number one, cutworm, number two, powdery mildew. Probably the two most major issues for growing cannabis in Hawaii, especially anyone this side of the highway, Malka side. So the, the health of your habitat, the health of your soil, the health of the plant is going to be, that's going to be your first defense. Right? Your first defense is health. Your second defense is habitat and biodiversity. When all else fails, you got to integrate an, an integrated pest management like a neem oil or a potassium bicarbonate. So I'll tell you right now, your powdery mildew is out of control, you're going to need a potassium bicarbonate. You're not going to spray it when they're in flower, but you can spray it all day long in veg and that will kill powdery mildew three or four applications, you'll eradicate powdery mildew, and now you got your plants on track. Cutworm. Cutworm's a really tough issue. The number one way to deal with it is health, again. And then the last resort way, and I didn't tell you this, is the product called BT. And again, I, again natural farming, not advice from a natural farmer but a, a, a ganja farmer in Hawaii who wants to pull off some actual flowers. Certain times of year, don't get me wrong, certain times of year you don't need to do this. But when, when the caterpillars are heavy, you're going to have to use a little BT just once when the buds are about your pinky size or your thumb size. Just once and you should be good. Excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry, BT is a Bacillus thermogenes. There you go. And, and it's, it's actually a, a, a microbe that occurs in nature. 
but it doesn't occur in the abundance or the lab-grown variety that you can buy in the bottle at the store. So it is, a, it is a, the microbe itself is God created, but then they, they grow it out in a laboratory and they concentrate it into a product. Now this product is not good for your health. Even though people spray it all, anyone who's eaten lettuce in Hawaii, you're getting BT all day long. You should wash your lettuce really good. 99% of lettuce farms use BT. Almost all food producing farms use BT in Hawaii. So wash your produce. The BT interacts with your gut biome and it fucks you up. And that can, it can lead to lots of diseases to do with the in, indigestion, uh, bowel movement, all this kind of area. BT can really mess with that. So not, not good to spray it when the keiki are outside. And, you know, and again, I'm just telling you this because I'm being honest with you guys. That, that's, that is a product that you're going to need to employ to pull off cannabis in the higher altitudes of this island. And that's just all there is to it. So to, mi to minimize it and to use it as directed, super critical. Again, I didn't say that. <laughs> no BT. Dude, no. What, is, what do the cutworms do so bad here? They'll just destroy the whole bud as soon as they, basically the whole, the whole top will be gone. And they, own, they go for the tops. And where do they go? Right to the tip. They, they're not taking your bottom buds. They're taking your crown royale. It's like a caterpillar kind of? It's a caterpillar. <laughs> it's the, uh, I'm pretty sure they're white fly larvae is really what they are. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, just the baby white fly is basically what it is. It's a white fly larvae. Of flies. Right, you know you got those. So this is just some more looking down. Uh, like this is a row. These are two mounds of living soil, cover crop. You know, I've already chopped it back once. This is some of the survivors coming up. This, this has been flipped over to, uh, to flower a few weeks ago. I got a question. So are you growing multiple greenhouses? So you'll have your lights, you'll butt them, and then if you want to keep your rotation going, you have another set going? Yeah, so uh, like if you're going to do this for a consistent uh, medicine or product or something you're gonna want to have two greenhouses yeah right right so when so when one's in and then I'm off grid so I only can like have li enough power to have lights on on one so this one's on veg and then this one the lights are off and then you have another separate side for your cloning zone right yeah and that just feeds everything right right yep yep exactly good questions uh, more, more shot of the cover crop and how I always like to point out to people the bugs are eating this but they're not eating this. Another one of Master Cho's pointers of why cover crop so crucial and not always chopping your grass real low and trying to go for that pretty look but more of, of a nature look, a natural look. And Yep. Are you using like some fancy lights or are you just using regular LEDs? Yeah, and since I'm off grid, it's just pure LED, like it's cheap. Yeah. On grid, maybe I would, I would throw up some cool light that might help them grow through the evening and stuff. But right now, it's just to mitigate them from going into flower too early. Right, right, right. So it's just cheapy lights. And are you buying those bulbs that are like, you know, full spectrum, full spectrum and yeah, stuff? No. Nope. Um, in the beginning, I did. And then I realized that just any LED from the store works just fine. Any, any colors or anything? No, like that's what I, like in the beginning I was like, oh, you got to buy the full spectrum. It's got to be that LED with the purples and the blues. And I used those for years. And then as they went out, I would just replace them with any kind of ch cheap LED I could find. Works Soft good. white, cool white. They all just keep them in veg. Here's, a, here's something funny. Uh, like I have a, um, this is, say this is my yard right here and there's a cannabis plot here and then right here is a, a, a veg tent for my clones and there's a light on here all the time, right? 24-7? Yeah, I mean it doesn't have to be but that, that yeah. my timers always break. But anyway, there's a light on here and then there's cannabis plants in here, right? The, the cannabis plants along this row will stay in veg because of the light bleeding here but the ones that are shaded from these will flower. You know, so just that much light, the ambient light coming from here, the same age plant side by side, even the same plant 
the same plant will have vegetative tips on this side and flowers on this side. The same plant. Fat cola, vegetative tip being, uh, being exposed to that light. And what do you think about that? Flower that first and then it goes down to? What's that? Doesn't the top of the plant will flower first? And then like as it goes on the bottom of the plant? The, the, um, the top of the plant, so... Well, the, so, so your growth is at your tips, right? They call, they, they call the tip of a plant. You know, your plants are growing like this, whatever. The tip of the plant is called, does anyone know what it's called? The apical maris. The apical maris. Apical maris. And that's what that tip is going to go. It, it grows upwards from that tip, right? So usually this top cola will have white hairs the longest. But then these ones will ripen the fastest, right below it. That's what I notice is that the, the very top will kind of like always throwing white hairs, it seems like the longest. But then the buds right below that, these buds or these next branches are my indicators if the plant's ripe. Those buds below the very tip because I know that tip is still telling it to grow, grow, grow. So yeah, you were right and, and wrong in a way, you know, you're, yeah. What is the indicator that you know that it's ripe? Okay, well let's look at some of these plants right here. That, that, that's a ripe bud. And number one, I can tell amateur-wise from the hairs. They'll tell any amateur ca cannabis grower, look for the hairs. When you got more than 50% brown, that's a good indicator you're getting to ripeness, you know? But that's, that's like a very beginner style, you know? What, I, what I'm looking for is bud density is key to knowing it's done. When you go up and you squeeze it, if it's still soft, it has a lot of growth still to do. You want it to be hard. Because when you chop that down, if it was soft, it's going to shrivel. You're going to go, what happened to my bud? But if it's nice and hard, it'll keep and stay like that. Another thing I'm looking for is, uh, is these trichomes to, to start turning amber a little bit. So I don't want it to come out in the bud just to look all white. Like even this one, I can tell this section around here is getting ambery. All these trichomes are kind of ambering. And uh, pretty soon you'll just tell by the vibration of the plant if it's ready or not. A lot of other factors will make you pull it early, especially in Hawaii, being the cutworm, the powdery mildew, the rain, the uh, uh, ver various reasons why you'll have to tell you the truth. 99% of the herb on this island that's grown is cut early because it's so hard to finish the thing all the way unless you live on that side of the highway. Um, you almost have to have your plants covered, right? If you're living on this side of the highway just because of the rain and the humidity will create mold. 100%. As soon as you're about to harvest, it'll just... Right, and that's only happened in the last, what, 15 years that we all clued into getting a greenhouse over our plants because the, the new strains that were coming for that, that those, those, those highly sought after cultivars weren't being able to finish in the rain, you know, so the cover was necessary and that is a necessary step if you're on this side of the highway or if you're in the mountains you're going to want to cover those plants. I even have, sometimes I'll have extra clones and I'll just throw them in my garden. They'll just like rot, you know, like I won't really even get anything off of them. They're just like rotting out there, you know, just because they get rained on every day. Now if it was a dry season like we used to get a few years ago, sure, you could rock it, you know. I want to go back to uh, to prepping that bed. So we um, we plant or we planted the bed, and then you know we turn off the lights, and we got our harvest, and we'll go over harvesting real quick here in a second. But I want to go through this first, re redoing your bed because it's living soil, and we're not going to go with the old grow store model of spending money at the grow store. It's just over. Those days are done. We got, they tricked us long enough and it's over. It's a joke now. The, the, the bags of soil that you buy in the store are meant to pump a crop once or twice real hard and then poop out and turn into crap. A bunch of perlite is all that's left after a few years. It just, everything else kind of disintegrates, breaks down and is gone and you're left with a bunch of perlite. And, and because the reason why is they want you to use that once or twice, dump it on the side and go buy more. They actually want you to buy more every rotation. So that means every two to three months you're buying 
five hundred thousand dollars of soil if you have a big or or forty dollars sixty dollars of soil if you have a couple personal plants you know so that's the old model the old model was to buy a bag of soil buy three bottles of nutrients and follow the directions as soon as those run out you got to go run to the store again and buy the same system every single company that makes nutrients has their own watering system and all of them you're using tons of their product because the more you use the more money they make so they're not going to sell you a product where you use two milliliters per gallon they're going to sell you one that's a taste tablespoon per gallon you know but anyway we're getting away from that and by doing so we need to have living soil so what is all this down here it's all the crop duff after the harvest all the stems and sticks and bee buds and and fan leaves and uh, um, all of the cover crop is now chopped down and put back on top of the soil. The smaller you can get that, the quicker the rotation you can have. Um, the longer you can wait for that to break down, the better for your next crop. There's another picture of heaping up grass and cover crop onto the beds. See there's a bed there and a bed there. This is the greenhouse roof up and down to the mountain, right? So the sun's always shining on it. The sun goes like that. Um, you lift up this and you got worms coming up to start feeding. All kind of goodness. To the other side. Just a close up. You can kind of see old cannabis plants in there. Uh, radishes. Cover crop, let, letting some of the cover crop go to seed is good. Pollinators brings in the, the uh, predator plants. And um, then you'd let that break down. You'd let that break down again and then start back over with that process of, uh, of, the, of the living soil, the putting your clones in the ground, cover crop, mulch. That's what comes after the cover crop is the mulch. Um, let's see. Okay, two weeks before. Okay, so then you're gonna you're gonna want to be ahead of the game too. So in veg, you're gonna use the veg formula. In a crossover, you're gonna start using crossover, and um, in finish, you're gonna use finish. If you want to use that that sweetener recipe, you can do that on your cannabis too. It works really good with the sea salt or the sea water. Um, so when your plants are going into flower, like, th like this, when they're looking like this, th there's something that needs to be done right now to keep these happy in Hawaii. Does anybody know what that is? You guys spray BT? <laughs> Hopefully not, but maybe. <laughs> that is almost about the time you would hit the BT also, but you would do one step before that. Clean them up a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Like lollipop or something? Not necessarily, but you're, what you're going to do is since, since I got a hedge here and I don't have individual plant plants growing that have full circle around it, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to basically take all these fan leaves off and clean up some of the unders that won't get any sunlight anyway. And that's just what that's going to do. That's going to be part of my IPM, my integrated pest management, and it's going to help keep airflow in there. It's going to help with stagnation. It's going to help with leaves that sitting on each other, creating spaces for bugs. It's going to help uh, keep the, um, the powdery mildew spores at bay. And uh, that's a critical step also in Hawaii. I used to do it two to three times throughout its growth. Um, my whole thing is the less labor, the better. So I've got it down to one time I do it. Or two times, I'm sorry. I do it once when they're really young and veg just to kind of get them going. And then I'll do it right now, kind of like second week, third week of flower, I'll do it again. Okay, um, so yeah, just I'm going to go over harvest real quick and then we'll take a lunch break and come back and do some demos. Um, so yeah, the, to harvest we're going to chop down those trees. <coughs> And here, here's a couple of just professional tips for, for harvesting. You're going to cut down the trees and then you're going to buck them off into branches. So you got like a branch this long, easy to trim. Take all the fan leaves off, leave the sugar leaf, hang it in a cool, dark, dry drying room. 
with a dehumidifier and an AC if possible. You want it, you want it at a 40, if you can get it down to like a, like a 55 humidity at like 55 degrees, wow, you're loving it. But if you could get it to 55 with a 60 degree, you're still loving it, you know? Um, the colder, the better. I mean, you don't want it super dry where it's like sucking moisture out of your plants at like a fast rate. So around 50, 55 is pretty good. And um, so you're gonna hang those up in that room with the fan on them and you're gonna have that humidity controlled and you're gonna let them hang seven to 14 days checking for moisture in the stem. As soon as the stems can snap and the buds feel nice and hard, you're gonna take them down and bin them, put them into those totes like these guys and, uh, and start trimming. You wanna keep those totes stored in that same cool dry space if you can't get to them right away and then you're gonna start trimming you're gonna buck the buck them down to uh, your, you know smokable sellable size whatever your plan is and then you're gonna do one more drying session so you could put them in a tray and put them back into that room that that cold dry room but you'll find in Hawaii that just through the trimming session they've re-moisturized a little bit and 99% and of herb you get on the market is just that. They didn't dry it again. They left it, and if you check the moisture content, it's way too moist. And that's why it's way too sticky, hard to burn in a joint, and it runs, because most people don't do the secondary cure or quick dry, which is essential. Yeah, if you, if you kept it in that room the whole time and you trimmed in there and it stayed like that and didn't re-moisturize, you should just be good to bag at that point, you know? But a lot of times, like even like the stems, you thought you got them good, but there's residuals in there and you won't even know till a month of it being stored if it's getting stored that long that, oh shoot, that's a little dingy, you know? And you start losing some of your smell and your vibration. They kind of get smushy and kind of moist and just no good, you know? So long-term storage of cannabis has to be in a refrigerator sealed. What'd you think? Yeah, in jars. Refrigerator's ideal. I mean, a freezer if it was super long-term. But just leaving them in a bag or a jar outside, they're gonna start aging pretty quickly and lose some chlorophyll. Now there are, there are um, jar cure techniques that like some old schoolers love like a, like no chlorophyll in their bud so there's ways to get the chlorophyll out but other people would say that it's low grade you know so it's all up to you at that point as, as in like it loses its green and it turns to brown wheat yeah like i know like uh like uh the artist capleton came to town and he said man i can't smoke this it's too fresh he likes it brown he like he want he goes he goes bring me that brown can you find me some brown bud you know when what he meant was fully cured bud, which which us in our cannabis culture don't deal with that kind of herb. Oh, but, it starts to grow mold. Like yeah, especially here. But like if you really cured it, like tie stick of old and these old school things, like people wanted that old cured bud that had no chlorophyll in it. And it's just something, it's kind of a thing of the past, you know, where now we want our fresh terps. We don't want them uh, uh, to be oxidized or to turn over. It's just like the old hashish has like a, a profile and a smell to it that they they loved back then but today we don't seek that that old hashish smell and stuff we want those fresh terps we want it we want a whole plant fresh frozen hash where it tastes like we're just eating the bud right off the plant you know and that's the evolution of where we've come with the technologies and the legalities and everything that we have so um, cannabis is nature's medicine cabinet man it's it's got everything It's beautiful uh, it's a sight for sore eyes. It's got the smell, the fragrance. In the Book of Enoch, they said the plant was reserved for the saints and that it had a, a fragrance like no other. Uh, these are the type of products that come from using KNF, high-end cannabis, high-end hashish. Here's another quick setup of, uh, of another uh, farmer that I helped him get his living soil together, and he put it in a giant bed like that. And then, uh, yeah, just that's that's pretty much it. So, any questions about cannabis? I know it was quick, but um, I'm showing you how to integrate these products 
instead of buying the bottled nutrients, all of these are one-to-one -one replacements for grow, crossover, and flower formulas that you buy in bottles. What kind of like stress training techniques do you use? Um, so to maximize yield, a lot of times, like I'll, uh, I'll come in here, like you can kind of see this uh, trellis netting here. So when they're young, I'll put one layer of trellis netting and I'll try to spread them out, like almost get their branches vertical because it'll cause these buds to come up like this and then the tip will start swooping up like that. So what I'll do is I'll spread those out as much as possible without breaking them or, or stressing them too hard. And I'll try to get them to go wide instead of high. And then once those grow up and before I flip it, I'll do one more trellis netting, but that one's more for stability because the colas are gonna grow up like that. So what the trellis netting on the bottom is to spread them. Trellis netting on top is to hold them in place once they start getting heavy. So um, besides that, that's kind of like the seawater thing. Is a, uh, is a minor stressor to produce more resin, more uh, terpenes. So those are, all, those are all types of positive stressors, that, that salt water thing in particular, and just the bending of the branches. Now there is like super cropping, where you could pinch it and bend it over, and I used to do that when I grew seedlings a lot, but not with the clones per se. You, More questions? You talk or you don't talk with the clones? So with the cl like myself, since I since I'm a, <clears throat> I try to be self-sufficient, you're gonna want to take some clones, and if you don't have space, the best thing to do is just to take the clones off of those vegging plants in your in your greenhouse. So I'll just come through and take clones off and I strategically top my plants. Um, I don't like to go overboard, but I do like to top them a few times to get the proper amount of spread and more branching. So what he's, what he's talking about is like when you tip, take the tip off of your plant, it causes the two under boughs to become uh, tops. Yeah. And so you can keep topping those and you'll get more branching, but in Hawaii in particular, if you do it too much, you're going to end up with this, this bush that's just like all like hard to deal with and it's not getting airflow through it and stuff. So there's tactics to that. And one of the tactics is when it's young, I like to do it once or twice while it's in its cup, first cups because you want it to get branchy. But then when it's old, you're just doing it to take a few clones and not really so much to make it branch out, you know. But when it's young, I like to top it to get it to get branchier. And when you take your clones, are you taking your tops or are you taking your bottom branches? Um, I, I usually will love to go for that top one too because my greenhouses only have a certain height to them. So a lot of times, like if I missed a few days or a week and I'm behind, they're getting too tall now. So I want to top them down lower anyway. And that's usually the best clone too. So yeah, I usually will take the top. Yeah, and then kind of just go down from there because I'm trying to kind of make them come down a little bit before they start flowering because you got to remember it's going to grow at least twice its size again in flower so if they're this tall when you turn off the lights they're going to be that tall when they're done you know so you got to keep that in mind how do you like to um clone like uh you don't use like a bottle clone x or anything like that? um so i have i i usually um for the for the the longer term classes i'll hand out a sheet of different gels that you could use for cloning and there's a recipe with aloe vera fulvic acid and uh, kelp yeah aloe vera fulvic acid and kelp those three together are like a really good cloning gel um even just straight aloe people have used before um but if you're just starting out, I would just get the Clonex just to make sure that you're going to be successful and not like pissed off or sad or anything. So the, clon <laughs> the Clonex works pretty well. Um, Earth Juice makes a, uh, a more organic version of like a gel. But yeah, there's definitely ways to do it on your own. And, and to say there's no stores ever available again, we have solutions. We have... Uh, we have anything with growth hormone, willow bark, can be put into a solution and used as a rooting gel. So anything that has like high growth hormone, we can harness that and use that as a uh, rooting agent. But aloe vera is a great one. Um, willow, yeah. 
more questions? What did you say? Aloe, phosphorus, and what? Oh, it, it was uh, aloe, fulvic acid. Um, it's a humic fulvic, like you can get that granular or you can get it liquid. And then um, uh, kelp, I mean, you can get that uh, in like a freeze dried kelp, like that uh, maxi crop kind of stuff that's just freeze dried so it melts right into the solution, you know, as opposed to like a powdered kelp that would just stay in chunks. No, that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for it to all go into a homogenous solution so you can dip into it, you know. And you're mixing that stuff up. Yep, so you could, uh, you could eat, the guy, the guy who made that recipe, his name's Clackamas Coot, and you can look him up on IG, he's an old school grower, he's really cool, and um, he even just buys that Lily of the Valley uh, uh, aloe filet liquid you can buy at a grocery store because he lives in the mainland. Mm. So he'll just even use just that filet gel that you can buy at the grocery store, I think it might even be cooked or something, I'm not too sure, but you know, so even that works. So yeah, I mean that was a super basic rundown, uh, a lot of information at once. We are kind of running up on time, usually longer than we usually go, but yeah, it's a, it's a, a loaded subject, you know, garden bed set up, you know, you're going to want to set up your living soil bed with mulch and logs on the bottom, the cover crop and mulch that we went over, but yeah, we could talk about this stuff all day long. Um, main thing is I want you guys to understand that we can get away from the grow store, grow store model of growing cannabis and start to rely on ourselves and our neighbors more to provide our, our medicine and our foods. That's, that's the takeaway from this and, uh, and also uh, upping our uh, value of our plants to be more valuable on the market by implementing some of these methods. So any more questions? Higher potency. All right, cool. First day is about philosophy and reasoning and going over the, the nutrients like we did today. And the second day is actually making each one start to finish so you can see how it goes. A lot of the fermentation things you can't even do in a two-day course. You need like a seven-day course to see the whole thing go through. And especially the IMO one through four will take uh, about 10 days to complete. So, um, you know, you can kind of just get a feel for it. I'm trying to inspire you guys to look further into it and uh, possibly with the information you get from today though, you, you should have a solid enough foundation that you can start doing these and implementing these on your own. And that's the goal. So um, we're gonna get started on two recipes today. FPJ and we can make a, a vegetative, a crossover, and a fruiting FPJ if we want to, or whatever time allows for. And then I'm also going to make a WCA, water-soluble calcium. So in this jar right here, I got uh, just crushed coral, and actually a little bit of crab shell too. And it uh, just kind of looks like that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, toast it on this frying pan, and the toasting does two things. Number one, it uh, burns out all the organic matter that's in there and gets, and gets rid of all that and, no, uh, and then makes it so your product won't rot when it's on the shelf because it doesn't have organic matter floating around in the vinegar causing different reactions. And number two, the charring actually, uh, or the, the toasting actually Bring, it, it changes the molecular structure of, of the product that we're trying to extract. So in the case of um, charring the bones, it's, uh, it's actually uh, pyrophosphate is the technical term for the phosphorus that we're getting from the, fr from the bones. And if they weren't charged, you wouldn't have that pyro part attached to it. And then what, according to Master Cho, it's pretty critical. So. Um, Anyway, these, these processes are, are hearkening back to ancient alchemy or modern alchemy and, and we're becoming the alchemist, the wizard, you know, we get to be the, uh, the alchemist, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not so long ago that all people had enough skills for all walks of survival. You were the gardener, the doctor, 
you know, the lawyer and the, you know, all that stuff you had the power of. Nowadays, they compartmentalize it. It's like the, my, my son's teacher says, oh, well, if he has a doctor's note, he's good. And I said, well, I'm his doctor. So I'll, I got to write the note, right? For some reason, that didn't fly. But that's how, it, that's how it's got to be. It's got to be that you're, you're smart enough, empowered enough to be the doctor. You're the doctor, not the guy who went and got brainwashed for 8, 12 years, you know? So anyway, I'm going to bring this, uh, bring this over a little more so we can see it. I'm not too worried about it at all. It's just, uh, it's just like sand from the beach, you know? It hasn't really, this isn't a refined product or anything like that. It's just a, <coughs> a washed coral sand from the beach. And so this is just going right on the frying pan. And we don't really need too much because we're just gonna make a jar today, so. So um, the recipe for KNF usually calls for eggshell, and eggshell is going to be the toasting process is pretty critical for the eggshell. There's a timing to it. You want them marshmallow brown. You don't want them burnt. You don't want them un untoasted. And there's also a, a, a burning of the organic matter again in the eggshell that's critical to getting it toasted. So um, the toasting of the eggshell is a more delicate and and. Uh, Paid attention to process with the char with the um, the calcium carbonate or the the uh, crushed coral. <clears throat> it's pretty basic, you know. You can just come back every few minutes and give it a little stir like that, you know. Um, it doesn't really burn per se too easily because it's just kind of like a rock substance, you know. So I'll just basically leave it like that. And usually when you get the crushed coral out of the, the bag, um, $5 a bag, a, a BEI or at Farm and Garden for a local dredged sand or coral from the harbor at Kauai High. They take it, they rinse it, they dry it somewhat and rebag it. So it usually comes pretty moist. And, uh, and the indicator for me when it's done is that, uh, that I'll, I'll start seeing it powder up and kind of be in, in a really small particulate instead of all kind of um, like looking like more like sand when it's wet. And so what's cool about this and what we're going to watch in a minute here is, uh, is the process of it uh, solubilizing in the vinegar. And the vinegar is a weak acid. So that's what I, when I teach KNF, I want people to understand the basic science behind why this is true and why it's working. It's not just a mysterious thing. Yeah, it is alchemy. It is wizarding, but it's not mysterious. It's just truth, you know? It's just, you could break it down into simple science if you want to, you know? So, so um, what we're doing is we're taking the calcium and solubilizing it into a liquid. And as long as that's a weak acid like vinegar, it'll actually break the calcium down and actually make it into a, a water-soluble calcium. So that's what we're doing. The vinegar is a weak acid. And again, remember we needed it at an acidic state of less than 2.4. Couple little chunks in there or something. But yeah, this is almost even looking good. I had already kind of pre pre dried this out before I brought it, so. This will usually take me, if it's a fresh batch of coral, probably about 20 to 30 minutes to kind of get it nice and dry and powdery where I, where I want it. And same thing with the eggshells. If you got it on the right temperature, which is like a low heat, um, it's going to take you about 20, 30 minutes to kind of get it to that charred state you want it. And it's with the eggshells again, it's like a marshmallow brown you're looking for. Like just like a nice toasted kind of thing. So this one's almost done here actually. Just make sure that all those little uh, organic matter chunks are out. 
But um, another thing when you make these recipes, if you're going for long-term storage, you're going to want to use a non-living vinegar for long-term storage of these products. I don't ever, I just make enough to have a batch for a couple rounds of, of like gardening or something, or IMO4 teas, and uh, I still use just my living vinegar. But a lot of people, like if you're making living vinegar, like that fruit vinegar recipe, and then you wanted to make this and have it for long-term storage, you can go ahead and boil your vinegar ahead of time and let it cool, and that'll kill off any, any living things in the vinegar, and now you just got like a store-bought uh, pasteurized vinegar. All right, I think that's looking good as far as uh, class's sake is concerned, which is the best. And what we're gonna do is, um, you usually let it cool down a bit. I like these, these jars are a uh, natural farmer's friend. These half gallon mason jars is kind of like for a, for a smaller medium farm are fine. Uh, the five gallon buckets, once you start being into a bigger farm or if you have a piece of property to take care of or multiple crops or row crops or multiple greenhouses, you're gonna wanna start making these in five gallon buckets or jars. So I'm just gonna spoon some of this in here. The ratio that Master Cho recommends is one to 10. Um, product to vinegar. It's fine to go over that a little bit. Not a problem. Don't really want to go under that though. And one to ten is pretty easy because um, if you just could imagine with your eyes breaking this into ten parts, you know, and then like, you know, it's like one, two, three, four, five, whatever, ten. And uh, <clears throat> just as, as a thing of principle, we're going to go ahead and keep that one-third airspace too. Even though it's not a fermentation, it's not as critical, you can fill it up a lot more. So I, I might go like maybe more like a quarter, but you do want some breathing room but it's not a fermentation, so that one-third airspace thing isn't gonna be critical to the, uh, to the microbial sets that we're looking for, like in the FPJs or the, OH, or the um, FAA, fish amino acid. And um, also, one tip or rule to follow is you always put your eggshells or your coral in the jar first. You don't put the vinegar first because it's gonna have the opposite reaction. It'll, it'll bubble over like 10 times as fast. So, so what I usually like to do is add a little bit first. And you can already see the reaction that you get. And what that is is the uh, calcium dissolving into weak, uh, or into weak acid, yeah, into solution. And uh, how Drake once said it, he said, uh, you know, Babylon's got problems, we got solutions. So these are our solutions, you know, and they call them solutions, you know. And they're a solution to many problems, so it's a good thing. You just see that action, and what you're witnessing is mostly calcium. But there's a, there is a, a crab shell in there too, so there's some chitin dissolving into liquid. And the reason why I don't just pour it all at once is I'll get, it'll just start bubbling over the top if I did it too fast. So you want to just keep pouring in a little bit at a time. But yeah, this one's pretty cool. It's a good one to do with children because there's like that immediate result and immediate uh, understanding of what's happening. So it's a good entertainment one. And a good one for class too, because the same thing you can witness, you can witness it happening right in front of our eyes. This is gonna <clears throat> stay in there for uh, seven to 10 days, is the recommended by Master Cho, and then you strain it. Personally, to be honest with you, is I just, because I know I'm gonna use this within like a month or something, I just leave it in there. And it just keep, it'll just keep bubbling in there. So I was told when I first, started learning about KNF, I was told that you, you wait for it to stop bubbling. 
I've never in my life seen it stop bubbling. Maybe I'm using too much because we are over a 1 to 10 ratio even with that. Maybe I'm using too much the kind, but I don't know. It just keeps on bubbling to me. <laughs> and, and I was also told you know you're at saturation when it stops bubbling. Like calcium is, has peak saturated the vinegar. But literally, I've never seen it stop bubbling, and I've literally, even if I did think it stopped bubbling, if I added more, it kept bubbling again. So, I'm not too sure what, what, what to say. I would have to debate or reason with some of the, the, uh, the KNF teachers that taught me that to find a conclusion. So yeah, you guys get the gist of that. <clears throat> and again, if, if you do make it with uh, live vinegar, like this is live vinegar, you might end up getting a SCOBY on top, but that's fine too. And then you're gonna do a breathable lid, which again is either a, a paper towel. I'll just show you real quick, cause we got one here. Breathable lid is, this is the best breathable lid, like a, a uh, t-shirt or a sock or something with small pores and then you can just screw this lid or use a um, rubber band. Uh, lazy man style would, would be just uh, kind of just lightly screwing this on and leaving this so it can push any air that builds up in here can push and escape. But that, that one you have a tendency like some bugs can kind of pry their way in there sometimes and stuff. But what I would do is I would put this on there you can mark the date on here on the top or on the jar and then you know you know this is now out in your lab you got your ferments going you got stuff going and you you know you're good and so it's so easy like a lot of people a lot of people will come to the classes and they won't practice this because it's it's a new thing in your life and i understand that anything new like like uh, i try to do like yoga like you got to incorporate it into your life or else you're not going to do it as like a, a part of your life you know so until like something becomes a habit or a ritual or something it's just not part of you and i understand that and that's why a lot of people don't get into natural farming and they just go to the store because their habits and rituals are are something else that take up 24 hours a day you know but uh, but what i'm encouraging you to do is maybe replace some of those unhealthy habits and rituals with these ones and uh it's not hard at all. Is my, the other thing of my point why I'm saying this is that once you uh, you wrap your mind around these recipes and you've made a couple of them, they're so easy. It's like, bro, I can just go make my things in a couple hours and I'm done for months. I got months of nutrients in a few hours. Yeah, okay, the FPGA, I gotta check it for a little while. Da 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 da. But it's only a few minutes a day that you just check on that and then you're moving on to all your your other tasks, you know. So. Um, I encourage you to, to set up a, a uh, covered area or a side of a house or, or a, a place in your garage to start a little KNF zone. These bins work great if you don't have a lot of storage space to put ferments in and you can have like a little breathable cover on there um, and just kind of keep rats out and stuff. You know, if you just, if you don't have like a dedicated space or room, you can use these to ferment in and um, yeah. So that's pretty much it. I'll let that sit seven to 10 days and then I know I'm good to go. I'll come out here and I'll go like that is what I'll do. If I, if I have this cloth on top and I don't wanna give it a little shake, I'll just kinda go like that. And you'll see uh, from yesterday to the next day, it might not be bubbling that much, but then when you twist it, it'll go and start like a whole nother rapid bubbling. So that's it. And that's gonna be your um, one to, uh, a thousand? I believe so, one to a thousand ratio. So that's just a teaspoon per gallon or four milliliters per gallon. And uh, you got calcium. Every plant in Hawaii needs calcium pretty much, um, unless they're like right on the beach or something. But anything up here in the hills is, is pretty much lacking calcium. Again, because it's a new earth. Old earth, like uh, old seabeds in uh, Arkansas or wherever the old oceans used to be in the mainland. They got plenty of limestone, calcium deposits, uh, you know, old, old 
ways that they've cre uh, created and held on to calcium. So any questions about the WCA recipe? Is it bioavailable to humans in this plant? Yes. And yeah, so, so you're going to add this to your water at the same ratios and you should see your fingernails come thicker, your hair should get thicker, and uh, you could also probably use it topically, but Master Cho says to drink it internally and um, you're going to see all those properties. Uh, Calcium is also hard to get in, uh, in uh, human beings, vegan diets. You know, so incorporating this, it's like taking a calcium tincture, right, right to the uh, to the system. Yeah, I just want to make sure you balance that with magnesium. Good point. Good point. So she uh, she just made the point of uh, balancing your magnesium to your calcium to make them both in the right ratios in your body for the health benefits. Next, we're gonna make some FPJs. So uh, another one of KNF's easiest recipes is the FPJs, a cutting board, and I got a cleaver or a knife or whatever is kosher for you. And we'll make a few right now. A lot of it's these fresh growing tips. Uh, it says weed whipped maybe a month or a couple weeks ago and has a bunch of fresh growth. I also made sure to get some of the microbes from the soil. Now you don't want a bunch of soil, but you want some a little bit of dirt left on the roots. Um, some some roots, if you're going to use the plant with the root, then go ahead and leave some soil on there. And so, uh, super simple process. Again, you're going to cut depending on the size of your jar. So if this was in a five gallon bucket, I could leave them more like three or four inches. But since I'm doing it in a little jar, I'm gonna get them kind of small. So what's cool about this honu honu grass, if you uh, check it out um, and you squeeze it, there's a lot of plant blood in there. Like a, like a slimy aloe vera kind of texture to it. So it's a great one to use. Any, any weeds or plants that have that kind of juiciness to them are a good sign. Other stuff you want to look for for a good, a good FPJ material is vigorous growing on your property with, with no assistance. So like weeds that are really vigorous and strong and healthy. So you don't necessarily want to get the yellowing disease stuff for FPJ. You want to get that healthy weed that not, no bugs touch it, you know. This is just one type of FPJ you can make out of that really vigorous weed on your property, you know. So we got it like that. And then a quick way just to see your ratios is uh, because this one's um, one to one by volume, not weight. And uh, you can use pretty much any sugar that still has the molasses in it. So raw sugar, brown sugar, um, evaporated cane juice, coconut sugar, um, well, are all good. White sugar, not you don't want that one necessarily try to avoid that one. Worst case scenario, it would still do some of the properties we're looking for. But um, straight molasses has been found to have too much uh, water in it and can, can lead to uh, premature rotting of your FPJs. But um, if you can afford or find organic sugar, even better, especially for human consumption. But if you're looking for the cheapest route, you can just get this Costco sugar it's, it's fine for um, the alchemy. Again, we're, we're aiming for the alchemy of these recipes to take place. And sometimes the, the highest grade organic thing isn't necessary, but if your mind and spirit t tells you to do it that way, then go for it. But the alchemy, like the cheapest beer for the, uh, for the OHN, oh, we didn't even go over OHN, but the uh, Oriental Herbal Nutrient. You know, you can buy the cheapest beer or the cheapest vodka because the, the alchemy is what we're going for. The alchemical reaction. 
Did you know that? Oh. Go ahead. Oh. I know with the brown sugar, it's the osmotic pressure. Does it does the osmotic pressure um, basically happen with all the other sugars that you name? Yep, the same thing, and that's okay, why. So, so it still does that. that yep. alchemy, right? Yep, and that's sure right, that's exactly. And that's that's why we really want the full plant to be coated with sugar, because like Ola just mentioned, the process that's happening, the scientific term is osmotic pressure. The sugar is actually causing the liquid inside to want to come out of the plant and bind to the sugar molecule. So the plant blood that's inside your plant, the hormones, the plant blood that contains all these beneficial phytonutrients are going to, uh, to come out and juice out of the plant. And here's the key, it's without rupturing the cell wall. So you could blend up all this stuff together and stuff and da 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 da, but you're getting a bunch of broken cells and a bunch of of uh, cellulose scrap and stuff. So this this is is uh, creating this alchemical process where it's just extracting the goodies right out of it. So uh, so to me, like that right there, this is how I usually will do it. Is not even really worry about measuring per se. If you feel more comfortable measuring, you should do that. If you uh, if you have scales and everything and you feel like that's the way to do it, then, then by all means do that. I love to just kind of go with the flow and, and hope for the best, and usually it is the best. And what so, I do with the five gallon bucket is I step up on a weight scale, and you see your weight, and then you step up on it with the five gallon bucket, and you see the difference, and then you can match it with the sugar. Nice. Okay. That's a good tactic. It's a good tactic. So now what I'm going to do is uh, just kind of massage this in, little lomi lomi style. But really it's just coating it, you just want to make sure it's coated. Um, another thing about sugars, real quick, like you can see this uh, dark brown sugar here. This is an organic sugar that I wanted to use. And what I soon found out is that the, the, granules, the granules were too big. They weren't doing a good job at coating the plant. So I wasn't getting the uh, proper um, reaction that I wanted to get. But you can uh, either, either grind these in a blender or grinder, um, or you could use it 50-50 with more of the ground up, finely ground up stuff and uh, get the job done. So that's plenty right there. Like. Uh, that's well coated. You can see that. It's got plenty of sugar on it. You can, yeah, I mean, if you, if you overdo the sugar, it's just gonna float to the bottom of the jar. So, you, so it's not like you can really overdo it per se. I mean, of course, you don't wanna way overdo it, but. The high grade. <laughs> And then when we get this going, what I want to do is get keep it packed in the bottom of this jar. I mean, you don't need to use like a press or anything, but just like human grade pressure in there. And we're gonna pack this all the way up to uh, how full? Uh, two thirds. Two thirds, right? Two -thirds empty. Yeah. This is what usually that top line. Yeah. I mean, if you just you know, like how I how I always do uh, two thirds is, you know what half looks like, you know what four quarters looks like. Go between those two. <laughs> I don't know why our mind like works like that. It's like it can easily tell half and pretty much easily tell three quarters, but All right, so that's pretty much it right there. Throw a little more in there. Might as well use all of it. It'll break down a little bit too. 
So if I fill this at three quarter, by tomorrow it'll be down to one third. You can already see the reaction taking place in the bottom of the jar. You see all the, there's already liquid building up in there. So that's a done deal right there. Breathable lid, again, I can just do the lazy man style or I could put the, the uh, paper, towel. paper towel style over it. Make one more real quick just to show you guys how easy and quick these are. Got some unripe banana. Did you do a sugar cap? Would you recommend a sugar cap? Or not? Um, I don't usually do a sugar cap unless uh, like the fruit juice, the fruits can take a sugar cap. I don't, I don't, I just, you know. What's your, what's your human bio on that? I just like to uh, keep the sugar to a minimum if you can. So just to have enough to get the job done, you know. I don't know, I, I feel that the FAA is way more of the sugar cap thing that on the FPJs it doesn't really matter. Yeah, the one on the grass is the bad job. Yeah. And those what would the banana be? So the unripe fruit is a crossover. And then the ripe fruit is a, a flowering or a ripening. And, and banana also by itself is a potassium supplement, the FPJ of banana. So um, NPK, you know, K is potassium, you know. It makes sense, right? K, potassium. Mm -hmm. There's also another K recipe uh, for Master Cho gives of um, uh, like a biochar or a, or a burnt char of, of uh, tobacco or sunflower. And you make like a biochar or like an ash out of that and, and soak it in water kind of ferment it in water. And that's a, another recipe. It's not part of the nine core, but uh, it's like an advanced KNF recipe. So, um, cannabis makes a good FPJ. And uh, a good rule of thumb for natural farming is same plant to same plant. So if I want, if cannabis is its favorite food to eat is cannabis. You know, apples drop apples because the apple tree loves apples to eat. The apple didn't necessarily make the apple for you to eat, but for its, it loves its whole root biome. The, uh, the microbes that associate with an apple love apple. That's their whole thing, you know? So uh, when we're, when we're, mulching our farm we just mulch down the same plant right onto the roots when we're flipping over our cannabis beds we chop down the stock or even chip the stock right back onto the soil you know we let our root ball decay into the soil we don't pull the whole root ball out and throw it on the side you know that any it's like it it's like your, your plants taking up nutrients right nitrogen phosphorus micronutrients copper, aluminum, all these metals, everything's going in there, right? Where, where, do, where is it? Does it just like go out the tip and disappear into the air? Like it's always cycling, it's, it's now it's in the plant. It doesn't disappear into the air. It stays in the structure of that plant. So if you want it, it, it if you think it's sucking it out of the soil and then you're gonna take that, that thing away from the soil after, that that's, goes back to that um, that modern way of thinking, you know, because now we got to supplement something to put back in the soil instead of just what we took away putting back on. So mulching with itself is the best, you know. Um, that's a general rule of thumb. But the reason why I brought up cannabis FPJ is sometimes it's good to add a little bit of juiciness to it. And what do I mean by that is like some comfrey or some honu honu grass. <clears throat> or some <coughs> aloe vera or something <coughs> that'll, that'll uh, just help kick it up a notch with some, with some uh, juice, you know, some plant juice. 
Aloe vera also makes a great FPJ. It's one of my favorite. Really good one. But anyway, let's do this. That works for like something like uh, Olana, which is a root. <laughs> right. And it, that's already dry. It's already dry. needs so a little more really, juice. Yeah, it doesn't really have that extracted juice that you want. Right, right. So you would add like an aloe or comfrey or a hono hono grass. I, I would, I think that, and I think now we're talking about like uh, advanced KNF and stuff, you know, of like where our mind can go with these things, you know, and uh, what we could, what we could possibly bring Master Cho's teachings to the world and, and to ourselves and use our intuition to make them even expand, you know. I'm all good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's going already. So yeah, I mean, you guys just see how basic it is, you know what I mean? And then like if I wanted, so not, so what, what I'm trying to show you here too is like, I got my ve veg FPJ. I got my finish FPJ and then in here I got these flowers that I could make a third one from. So if I just did this one morning, now I'm good for on the on at least part of my my whole crops. You know, I don't got to go to the store for any of the any of the stimulants or the or the foods. This is KNF food, so you give it to a plant when it's hungry, you know. It doesn't necessarily have an NPK even though it does have an NPK, but that's not necessarily why we're giving this one to our crop. This one's a microbial food, and in, in natural farming, we, we, uh, well, we feed the soil, not the plant, right? You feed the soil, and then all those little guys feed the plant. All right, so we're just about to two-thirds there. Pretty much it right there. And then we'll do a breathable lid. Wipe out, wipe down the outside of the jar. Um, you can also uh, use a little bit of vinegar to wipe down the outside of the jar if you think ants are gonna come around. But the breathable lid will keep uh, any bugs out so there's no bugs. And again, uh, what are the two signs we're looking for? Anybody know? To harvest your FPJ? A little moldy little, little bit of white mold and, and the smell. Right, so we're using our human bio instrument to tell when these are done. And uh, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, we're using the guide, which is three to seven days. Three to seven days. Um, again, too, if, uh, if you come out here and these are floating at all, I can stick a rock on here the next day to keep it under the brine or under the liquid. So yeah, these are, these are done. I'm just gonna wash them off and and then I would mark the date and uh, especially in the beginning you, know, you really want to mark your stuff just so you're familiar with with uh, where you're at with it if you're not paying close attention to all the details having the date and what what's in there is really important on the outside of your jars um, any other questions about that yep. FPJ bro the high grade um, the other the other one nutrient we didn't go over is the OHN, which is the plant medicine, and um, that one's a tincture. So that one's a uh, it's actually a medicine tincture, just like you would buy from the health food store, with the garlic, the ginger, the angelica, the cinnamon, and the licorice in the recipes in that guide that that I gave you guys, and that one's one of the most involved recipes but also very easy once you understand what you're doing. All you're doing is making an FPJ out of the herbs and then you're extracting with, um, with alcohol, with vodka. And it's, it's a very basic process but complicated when you first get into it. So again, you can always hit me up if you have questions about making these inputs or you can always watch the YouTube Chris Trump videos because he uh, he made them years ago and they're pretty much out there for the world to see and 
they got it step by step pretty much to the T. So um, any other questions on this process or on KNF in general or uh, cannabis farming in general, anything like that? So here, like, you can uh, plant the plant, like, are you using, like, your trimmings for your, yep. for your cannabis farming? Yep. So, um, so as far as cannabis goes, you can use all your fan leaves. You can use, uh, if, you're, if, you are, if you had a big garden and you were topping that day for that secondary growth, you could use all those tips. Um, third, thirdly, you can use the bee buds, like after you harvest some of those immature little middle ones. Those are really good to use too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, just, if, do we got any other questions? We good? All right, yeah, I just encourage you guys all once again to try, try some of these recipes. Start out with the nine core, start out with an FPJ, and just do it and you'll be amazed um, that you got these there at your disposal and you'll be amazed at how uh, these, these reliance and uh, making these recipes empower you in other parts of your life to do it yourself and to, uh, to seek producerhood instead of consumerism you know that's that's the takeaway we all want to be producers not consumers you know so uh, if you're a farmer you're instantly a producer because you you're growing produce literally <laughs> so sweet I give thanks everyone for coming forward and that's the vibes all right bless up